This special meeting will be conducted through teleconference and Zoom video conference. This meeting is accessible online and by phone, and those directions are on the agenda for this budget and finance meeting. If a public participant wishes to remain anonymous, please click on the drop down menu and click rename. If you wish to comment during the public comment portion of the agenda, please use the raise hand icon on the screen. And if you wish to comment by phone, please press star nine and wait to be recognized. Also, the committee has been informed that some council members who are not on the budget and finance committee may wish to attend this meeting remotely. Under the Brown Act, these members are permitted to attend the meeting as observers, but none of these council members may speak or participate in the deliberations in any way. I ask these members to refrain from using the raised hand function in Zoom or otherwise attempting to address the committee during this meeting. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Okay, so let's move on to roll call. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, Mayor Ergin. Present. Uh, Councilmember Harrison is absent and uh, Councilmember Drosty. Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Moving on to public comment. Are there any speakers on matters that are not on the agenda today and within the purview of the Budget and Finance Committee? Uh, so are there speakers on any matters related to budget and finance, but which are not agendized today? So I'll go to public comment and see if any hands are raised. I see Kelly Hammergren. Uh, I will recognize you first. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? All right. I gather from that smile that you can hear me. Um, so this is related to budget, but I want to tell a story of what happened yesterday. So I took a walk with my neighbor, both wearing our masks uh, and being careful. And as we started off on our walk, um, there were four police officers on bicycles that rode by us. Uh, she, my neighbor had a letter to mail. We stopped at the North Berkeley post office. And uh, there we saw the four police officers um, giving what my neighbor thought was a citation to um, an older man, gentleman, uh, sitting while black on the little wall next to the post office. So that was four police officers. We continued on our walk. We had a little gift that my neighbor wanted to drop off to her friend down in Milvia in North Berkeley. And then we walked back on McGee. And when we got to um, the dog park, um, there was a big gathering of police officers. Um, evidently a, a meter maid, one of those traffic trucks had run into a pole and had knocked on a stop sign. So there were five police cars, five of those traffic meter maid cars, uh, the van for the crime scene, 10 police officers all there. And it, it just, these two incidences make me think, what is going on with how our police are used in the city? Especially following uh, our chief yesterday complaining about the cuts to the police department and how they're losing officers. Do we, and my neighbor said, I mean, she was, she was just floored at the number of police officers standing around at this incident. So that's it. Thank you. My time's up. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on to um, Tom Bates. Uh, welcome. You are recognized. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I actually want to speak on the program, the regular item. So I'll pass on this time. Thank you. Did we get that? You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to hand over the chair to uh, Miss the, to the mayor because my internet is having some issues. So I'm going to log off and log back on. And Mr. Mayor, will you take over? Can somebody make him the co-host? I'm having some internet connection issues. Thank you. I'll, I'll log right back on. No problem. Uh, Mayor Bates, um, do you wish to offer a non-agenda public comment? Or do you want to speak on an agenda item? 
I, I would like to speak on Kate Harrison's item um, about approving an appropriation of money to be able to make sure that Old City Hall is, is substantially maintained. Okay. We will get we will get to that, Mr. Mayor, when we get to um, item number two. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just this is the first time I've joined you in a meeting. Like I know this. we're honored. Oh, nice. <laughs> so um, when we get to that item, please raise your hand, and we'll be sure to call on you. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, once again, this is public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, if you'd like to address. <clears throat> item two or item three or item four or item five, six, um, the, the action items will call public comment at that time. So I see Carol Morosevic has also raised her hand. <clears throat> Speak as an individual, I am looking forward to hearing the presentation on police overtime. Uh, in addition to that, it's always difficult to come up with a wish list when we know we're going to be facing additional budget cuts mm -hmm. because of the economic impacts of the pandemic. Um, and yet just as council is planning ahead in other aspects, uh, such as with the Adeline Corridor, as with the Civic Center visioning plan, we should be also having a plan for housing the homeless. Uh, we know that currently we have the momentum with the motels and it would be really good to keep uh to continue some master leasing of the motels possible purchase of the motels again this is difficult to ask for during the budget cuts and yet we're planning ahead on other aspects and we should plan have a long-term plan for the for the housing the homeless also um, and, and we need to capture the momentum we have now about purchasing or leasing these motels at a, at a lower price than when the economy would be good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Morosevic. Um, is there any, any other uh, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on items not on our agenda? We will take public comment on the action items um, including the discussion of the annual appropriations ordinance and the replenishment of the general fund reserves um, when we get to those items. Um, is there any other member of the public who would like to offer public comment on items not on the agenda? So please raise your hand or press star nine. Once again, this is public comment on items not on the agenda. John Kaner. Uh, just procedurally, Mr. Mayor, um, the um, funding, Kate's request for funding for um, Water intrusion repairs in the Civic Center buildings, that's an agenda item or? Yes, um, uh, if you'd like to discuss Councilor Harrison's proposal or any um, any of the um, proposed uh, major budget allocations, we will uh, take public comment on item two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, once again, is there any public comment on items not on the agenda? So please raise your hand. If you'd like to discuss the mid-year budget um, adjustments and the annual appropriations ordinance, we'll take public comment on item two. Okay, I do not see any additional race hands. Madam Clerk, any written comments submitted on non-agenda matters? Should you be read into the record? No, Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Drosty, are you back? I'm, I'm back. I'm not sure what's going on with the, my internet other than I might have some competing children with my oh. internet, uh, with the various Zoom classes, but I think I'm okay now. I may turn off my video when others are presenting just to make sure I can, I can hear, but hopefully um, everyone can hear me now. Um, all right, so thank you, Mr. Mayor, for taking over. Um, I'd like to uh, move through the agenda, and I see the first item on the agenda are the minutes for November 19th. And I was wondering if there's a motion to approve. Move approval. Okay, I'll second that. Clerk, will you call the roll? Yes, Mayor Arrigan. Yes. Council Member Harrison. Uh, abstain, I wasn't on the committee yet. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Drossi. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So uh, the first item on the agenda is the budget update. 
Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to extend uh, my heartfelt thanks to our city manager, uh, our budget manager, our finance director, and every single department head. I know these are really challenging times and you've been working so hard in addressing these issues, uh, responding to questions and so on. So I just really wanna appreciate all of you. Um, I think I also forgot to mention the deputy city manager. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, some people, but um, I, I wanna appreciate the work that you've done. And also I wanna welcome our colleague, council member Harrison to this committee. She serves as the alternate and um, her presence will certainly be additive. So welcome council member Harrison. And um, before we go to the city manager, I just wanted to ch check in with my colleagues about um, a few items. Um, one of which is that um, I imagine that the, the mayor will probably be bringing forward a budget um, update as well uh, for vetting. And so I was wondering whether Monday might be a good time for individuals to, to meet before we go um, for a vote on Tuesday. So if you remember what happened in June, we had um, uh, the presentation that we're gonna be getting today. And so we're able to digest uh, what uh, our city manager has put forward and then the mayor um, and we all sort of independently review um, this presentation and the mayor generally brings forward a, um, um, an item as well. And, and, and frankly, I mean, uh, I think anybody has that prerogative, but generally speaking, yes. traditionally speaking, uh, the, mayor, the mayor does that. So I was wondering if Monday morning at nine or 10 um, might work for uh, my colleagues and for um, Madam City Manager. Madam Chair. Um, I can't raise my hand. April, if you can un-co-host me, that'd be great so I can raise my hand and make Councillor Drossi a co-host. Um, I think that's an excellent suggestion. You know, we, we actually just got some information like 15 minutes ago that I just printed out and I have, I need to digest it. So um, I think it would be helpful for us to have time over the weekend to review all this information and to come, and I intend to come forward with a, a proposal. Um, so I would support meeting at nine or nine thirty or ten o'clock on Monday morning. I think, um, I mean, nine works for me if it works for everybody else. Um, but Ma but I'll, Madam City Manager, I see you <laughs> hesitating there. <laughs> not so much hesitating. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not so much hesitating. I'll just make it work. I'll um, re rearrange the calendar. Thank you. I think this is a very important discussion. So thank you, Councilmember Harrison. Yes, that works fine for me. Thank you. Okay, so let's say nine o'clock on Monday, um, and uh, yeah, so let's let's pencil that in, pen it in, <laughs> and uh, uh, appreciate it. So um, okay, so now let's uh, move on to the agenda. So under the very first item, I'm going to hand it over to you, Madam City Manager. Um, in the interest of time, what, what, what might be helpful is with this first item, I see there's sort of three sub items. I was hoping that you might um, do, be able to do back-to-back um, uh, -back presentations on the excess equity AAO and general funds reserve update. And then we can make note of our questions, um, ask, ask our questions, go to public comment and then have uh, other comments, and I was wondering if that works for everyone, um, just because I know there's a lot of information here, and so rather than bounce back and forth to have the three presentations from staff, perhaps go to public comment, and then have council members uh, provide their comments. Does that work for everyone? Yeah? Okay, good. Does that, does that sound okay, Madam City Manager? Yeah. That works for us. That works well. I think that's worked in the past and it uh, did allow us the time for you all to deliberate, which is what we really need. Okay. So just, you know, make sure uh, colleagues just to take sort of notes of your questions you have during these presentations and we will, um, and we will hopefully make our way through this rather quickly. Councilmember Harrison, I don't, I forgot whether I lowered, I, I, if, I think I forgot to lower your hand. Do you have a question? No, I was asking, answering your earlier question okay. about time. Thank Great. you. Thank you. 
All right, so um, I'll hand it over to you, Madam City Manager. Thank you, Chair Drosky, and welcome Council Member Harrison. You know how to come in right at the perfect time. We have a lot of work ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> there went that weekend, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All for your time. We um, we know this is a lot, um, and we do appreciate you all being patient with our staff as we trickle in information. We you know, had a lot of um, changes as we've moved forward, especially with AO and equity. But we appreciate all of your effort, and I just want to take my hats off to Teresa Berkey Simmons and Dave White and our finance director Henry Oikami. They have done a tremendous job, and thank you for recognizing them, Chair Drosty. Um, it's just been a lot of work for the departments as well, but that's okay. That's what we're here for. We're here to provide you all with the information that's necessary to make these hard and tough decisions that you have to make. So um, if you have questions, um, we are going to respond to those as quickly as we can. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa, and um, we'll move forward with the presentation. Okay. Good morning. So we do have, a, um, we have been throwing a tremendous amount of information um, to this policy committee um, and we very much appreciate um, the opportunities to meet. Um, this is an important committee and, um, and um, every time we're scheduled to meet, I actually am a little excited. So I wanna thank you for your time as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to David White, who will be talking about um, item 2A, uh, the general fund year in excess equity, and reviewing some of the questions that was submitted um, during this budget process. Thank you, Teresa, and good morning, and uh, welcome, uh, Council Member Harrison. Um, so what I want to quickly do uh, is just kind of navigate through the uh, memorandum that we did submit to you uh, late in the day uh, yesterday uh, pertaining to responding to a number of questions uh, that we received from uh, uh, the Budget and Finance Committee and City Council um, on our budget. Um, and there's a couple of items in particular that I would like to focus on. Um, not that any one of the questions is more important than the other, but two or three that are probably more substantive uh, relative to the other ones. So uh, the first one had to do with uh, a question regarding uh, borrowing from special funds and what resources are available um, to borrow from special funds uh, to pursue uh, city council's objectives. And so um, we provided a response uh, to you in the memorandum. Um, and what we tried to do was a couple of things. Uh, one uh, is we tried to point uh, you into the direction of where uh, we can talk from in terms of what our resources are available. And there's really a couple of places that we can look to for that. So uh, in our adopted biennial budget, uh, we do uh, provide uh, really an overview of fund balances for our various funds. So that would be for the general fund, for our special revenue funds, our enterprise funds, our internal service funds, et cetera. And so that's obviously one resource that we have. And we called out the specific pages in that document where we can look to. Secondly, obviously, is our annual CAFR. Um, and so uh, Henry and his team are working furiously on finalizing the CAFR for fiscal year 20. Uh, which will provide us those year-end balances uh, for those funds. Um, you know, in speaking with the city attorney's office, and uh, she may want to amplify or augment this conversation, um, you know, really, uh, as she looked at it from a very high level, not going on a detailed analysis fund by fund, but at a high level, council certainly has discretion uh, to borrow against a whole host of funds uh, really subject to your, your decision, decision making and your, and where you'd like to deploy resources. In looking at the issue a little more deeply, um, within the memorandum that we provided, uh, we did provide two examples of, uh, cities, and these were really just selected at random, uh, that have developed interfund policies. And this is pretty typical. Um, if this is a direction where uh, the Budget and Finance Policy Committee and City Council would like to head. Um, and really the thinking is uh, the following, which is 
you know, having an inner fund policy helps uh, obviously one to provide transparency into the process, but then two uh, really helps us at the staff level in terms of decision making uh, and really putting together the infrastructure in place and analysis in place uh, to be able to look deeply at the fund that is making the funds available and the fund that is receiving uh, the funds. One, uh, to evaluate uh, the resources and to evaluate the liabilities of any particular fund and to be able to provide that information forward to the city council. So typically what we've seen in sort of a scan of various policies is that these types of interfund loans are done on a short-term basis. Uh, so very similar, for example, to what uh, we're doing around T1 and making sure a couple of those projects can move forward until we do the financing uh, for those projects beginning of next calendar year. Um, and then we have typically found that uh, there's a guaranteed source of repayment. Uh, it's fairly well articulated and, and obvious. Um, and typically there will be uh, some sort of decision-making or action done by the governor bo governing body that oversees those funds. So in this case, the city council. So we've provided that outline for you, um, provided some sample policies. And certainly if this is a direction where the budget and finance committee and city council uh, would like to head, you know, we, we'd be more than delighted to uh, have that conversation and work with you on crafting uh, such a policy. So that was sort of the first uh, response that I would like to call out for you. The second one, and I'll be a, a little bit more long-winded about actually has to do with the issue of police overtime. And the Budget and Finance Committee and City Council have asked really some wonderful questions uh, about police department overtime. And we've really endeavored uh, to work, you know, really hard over the past weeks to really sort of unpack the question why. And I'll kind of unfold uh, some analysis for you uh, that kind of digs into that a little more deeply. And so what I'm going to do um, is share my screen because we did put together a little bit of a presentation uh, for you on this. And I'm trying to navigate multiple screens. Okay, can you see the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation? Great, thank you. So um, the question that, the, that was asked of us and when we presented um, in the past was around police department overtime is that we observed uh, the trend, uh, which was, you know, for the past many years, the police department overtime budget has exceeded actual expenditures versus what was budgeted. And so the question was why, why is that happening? And so we presented some high level analysis on that and looked at that and I'll, I'll review that, you know, very quickly. Um, and one of the paths that we were asked to take was, you know, tell us uh, what were the salary increases that were mm -hmm. brought forward and how have those impacted uh, overtime expenditures if they were adjusted accordingly. And in the memorandum that we submitted to you, uh, we did provide uh, what those salary adjustments are for the sworn side. And uh, we provided a sample calculation of what the overtime would be. So if you look at sort of what the starting point was of about 2.3 million, and you apply those salary increases over time, we ended up with a overtime number, overtime number of about 2.9 million. So as you can imagine, that left us scratching our heads because naturally uh, that still does not comport uh, with the overtime that has been expended. So uh, again, the question why came up, why is this happening? So let me walk you through this presentation, which I think will provide uh, some, shed some light on the type of work that we uh, have done to really try to help get us underneath the surface as to why uh, over time uh, has been at the levels it's been at. And also to help us explain and put into perspective the request that we're making as part of the AAO uh, for the $5 million allocation for police department over time. So uh, let me start with this slide. Um, what this slide does is just kind of walk you through the analysis that we did. So going from left to right, top to bottom, uh, we started off 
uh, with a high level of historical analysis of looking at the dollars. So what has our overtime uh, been budgeted and what have we done? And as I said before, that was a largely unsatisfactory uh, analysis because it didn't really give us much information to work with. So then we went a, a little bit deeper uh, and we looked at how overtime is being accumulated by category. And when I say category, I mean by the way in which our accounting system classifies overtime. So that could be what we call regular overtime, it could be sick leave, it could be vacation, it could be training, it could be a special event. And I'll share uh, some of that analysis with you. But that still was unsatisfactory and you'll see why, because it doesn't really tell us uh, what's happening at the operational level. So then we went a, another step further um, and we looked at over time, how over time uh, is really being assigned to the various divisions within the police department. So that might be patrol, communications, jail, investigations, et cetera. And that was actually very insightful. And why it was insightful and helpful to us is because it started to show uh, where uh, overtime was being generated from. And you could see pretty clearly uh, that it really is the patrol function is where the majority of the overtime is occurring. So what that allowed us to do was to start and isolate some of the variables in this equation and look more deeply at how overtime is occurring. And so what we did was the next level in which we went onto this was to look at the patrol uh, operation itself in that division. And we wanted to take a look at the overtime that is being generated. And the way we were trying to conceive of it as at least sort of a guiding post was to think about what portion of that overtime is fixed. So what is attributable to holidays, vacation, sick leave versus what might be variable. And we did that because we wanted to try to really get to the root of uh, what is a level of overtime that you know, pragmatically speaking is going to be needed to fund the department versus where there may be some flex. And so you'll see that in some of the exhibits um, as you go through them, particularly Exhibit 6, Exhibit 7, where we, where we tried to apply some dollars to it. And that really leads into the overall um, calculation of overtime need that we've done. And what we did was we really tried to provide three, four different ways of trying to calculate overtime need for you. This more detailed approach was one way. Um, another way that we tried to do it was just really looking at how, uh, based on how much overtime has been um, incurred to date, we uh, applied a, just a straight line projection on that. And then we also looked at a three-year average of overtime and a five-year average of overtime. And num numbers all tended to circulate within a range. What is important to, to note on that, though, is that one uh, piece of analysis that we didn't do, and I think we would love to spend more time on, is it doesn't actually apply really where we think hours are being going to be spent as it pertains to overtime and apply that to current hourly rates. So I would suggest at some level, uh, as we go through this analysis, that it's potentially a little bit more of a conservative approach uh, because it does blend sort of these historical salaries with the current. So I, I'll blow through this pretty quickly. This isn't telling you uh, or us anything we haven't seen before, but it just kind of walks through that those boxes that I shared. So this is over time for the past 11 fiscal years, going back to fiscal year 10 to fiscal year 20. The gray bar shows you what is actually incurred and the blue bar shows you uh, what was budgeted. And uh, nothing new to say here except for we've spent more than we've been allocated year after year. So as I mentioned, we went to the next level and we started to look at where overtime was occurring, again, by how it's classified within our system. And you can see uh, really, if you kind of look at some of these uh, bars and the colors, the vast uh, majority of the overtime is coming from regular overtime. You see uh, holiday pay above that, uh, special events uh, are there, sick leave, uh, vacation, and at the very top are reimbursable services. So one thing I didn't note earlier, and I, I will point out, is that there is overtime provided by the police department, and, it, and uh, there is a chunk of it, and it varies from year to year, uh, that does 
uh, generate a reimbursement. The department itself, just to be uh, transparent, doesn't actually recognize that revenue in their budget. Their budget is an expenditure budget. So that revenue comes into the general fund generally. And the department itself is uh, focused on uh, what are the expenditures they need and to have appropriated. So that is important to just sort of clarify when we're generating um, these estimates. So this is category. So then we took the next step, which was to look at overtime by operation. And this is where things started becoming uh, easier for us to start really kind of sharpening our focus and fine tuning our analysis. So you can really see here, the gray bar uh, represents the overtime that is generated from, from patrol operations. And you can see when you go back from fiscal year 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, uh, you can see that operations is really generating or accounting for uh, really the vast majority of overtime uh, for uh, the sworn side of the house. What was interesting uh, to us is that when you really look at a lot of these other divisions within the, de uh, the department itself, and you look at the historical analysis that is attached as an exhibit, when you look at those numbers really in aggregate and average them over time, they don't vary a whole lot. Um, and that was kind of interesting to us because, because they aren't really moving too much. It allowed us to say, okay, just in terms of isolating some variables, let's assume that those trends continue and let's understand what's happening more within the context of patrol operations. So that was our next jump. So uh, before I do that, I'll just quickly caveat, we looked at both sides of the house. Um, this is the non-sworn uh, side and this is just an accounting of overtime hours. Again, uh, you know, not too many peaks, not too many valleys, kind of stable over five years. And this kind of reinforces that messaging uh, in terms of where the hours are uh, located. In general, we did group holiday training, vacation, and sick into one category, uh, really because uh, those are uh, more reoccurring uh, or fixed type of expenses that we would expect. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we kept those as a block. So now we'll go to the sworn side. And this is an accounting of hours for uh, sworn operations. And you can see uh, naturally that the hours that are uh, accounted for over the years uh, aligns with the expenses that we're seeing uh, from the perspective of uh, the amount that we have been spending has been increasing and so has our hours. So now we'll go into the patrol functions. So this is where the majority of the overtime on the sworn side is being accounted for. And so what we did was we broke it up into regular overtime, the holiday training, vacation and sick leave, special events, uh, reimbursable services and all other. And what these you know, bars help to show when you line them up is you can see uh, the regular overtime uh, jumped in fiscal year 20, and um, special events, uh, you know, has had an increase as well. And there's, you know, been a number of reasons for those based on how the department has uh, responded uh, to various circumstances. And then you also notice in fiscal year 20 that reimbursable services is a much bigger chunk of the pie uh, than they have been in past years because of requests that have been made on the department to provide overtime services. So um, again, sort of walking through our thinking on this is our general thinking was that that orange bar, the holiday training, vacation and sick is going to be relatively speaking, a fixed variable for us. So where we spent a lot of time looking into was really the regular overtime category and the special event overtime category. And what you'll see um, in the spreadsheets that we provided to you was when you, what we did was we looked really at a detailed and a micro level at how overtime is being accounted for uh, in both the regular overtime category and the special event overtime category. And what we did was in trying to come up with an estimate was we didn't use the hours in those categories in total. We actually tried to really get granular with it and break out what we thought was more of a recurring category, a recurring expenditure for regular overtime. So for example, uh, when staffing levels get low, uh, as they are right now, 
uh, there will be more overtime required to keep uh, folks in the sort of continuously operating shifts. And that really is what patrol is. So to keep the minimum officers on the street, you'll see categories like uh, police under strength. Uh, overtime is higher now than it has been in the past. And there are other categories like that that you'll see uh, are more reoccurring as well as with the special event side. And we're, I'll be even more specific on special events. Things like July 4th, Solano Stroll, the Kite Festival, um, those are all events where we have had uh, increased numbers of police officers uh, to support those special events. So when we go to the next uh, chart, um, you can really see uh, how we broke it out. And this really will connect to uh, exhibit six and what's been attached to you. So when we look at the overtime hours for the patrol function, we were able to see that, you know, what we consider sort of the recurring functions uh, recurring hours, uh, you know, been relatively constant, have gone up a little bit more uh, recently, but you can see how the variable piece, uh, you know, as you'd expect, it really is showing sort of a variable fluctuation. Some years, it's a very small piece of the overtime algorithm. And then in other years, particularly recently, uh, it's a higher piece. Um, and that's attributable to our response around the protests earlier in the year, uh, response to uh, COVID-19, PSPS, um, et cetera. So all this was helping us build to an estimate of what we think uh, an overtime expenditure number should be for the department. So that really takes us to this slide here. Um, and again, we focused our work really on the patrol side because it is such a big driver of overtime. So um, just to sort of break out the pieces of this, uh, first we looked at holiday, training, vacation, and sick, um, uh, sick leave, and we applied really a five-year average on that and generated an overtime need of about 1.6 million just for that piece of it. Then we looked at the two categories of regular overtime needs and special event overtime needs. And again, we isolated that just down to what we uh, think or suggest might be the hours that are more of a reoccurring nature. And you can see there's about another million dollar of overtime need there. And then we you know, really looked at sort of uh, more the three-year trends and tried to come up with a number that would reflect what is the variable need uh, for the department. So what do we think might be needed to respond to uh, things that might occur during the year? And again, that was about $993, just under a million dollars, just to support uh, that component of it. And then for all other divisions, like I said, because you know the numbers have been relatively stable over the past five years, we just applied a five-year average to that overtime, and we came up with about $2.6, $2.7 million for a total number, a total expenditure requirement of about 6.3 uh, for the department itself. And then in summary, you know, again, we looked at um, really how this compared uh, to some of the other approaches uh, that we applied to come up with a number. So we looked at, you know, the fiscal year 21 trend. Um, we looked at uh, what is the overtime that's been incurred to date and assumed that was going to be a straight line going forward. And then we came up with a total need there of about 6.4 million. If we look at the three-year average, uh, we came up with a number about 6.8. A five-year average generates a number about 6.1. And then the analysis that we just summarized, which I'm calling on this slide, the hybrid analysis is about 6.3. So what that yields in terms of an additional appropriation based on this body of work ranges anywhere from about 4.3 million, which is just a smidge under $5 million. Um, you know, well within the range of what's been asked for, and I think, again, uh, from the perspective of that we're, this analysis is really based on looking in the past uh, and not applying those current rates, it felt as if that $5 million was coming across as a reasonable figure. What I would like to share, though, is that in going through this work, it definitely uncovered a number of things for us um, that certainly are next steps and follow-up that we would have. Um, I think, number one, uh, we certainly would love to spend more time, uh, you know, really digging into this analysis and coming up with an estimate based on 
hours work, current rates of pay, and by position type, I think that would be another piece of this puzzle that would help to provide a useful dimension to the work. Um, and then speaking from an operational perspective, you know, we certainly identified in looking really deeply at this that there are things we can do to refine and improve our overtime coding. There are things occurring in one category that probably should be logically uh, allocated to another. Um, and I think the department would uh, certainly appreciate, you know, given particularly with all the hiring that they've done, uh, some additional training to ensure consistency. And, you know, uh, this is really the chief's perspective, which is really looking at opportunities to control and reduce overtime uh, without compromising service delivery. So this was a big uh, uh, piece of work that we wanted to do and bring forward um, because we know at the last budget and finance committee, there have been a number of questions about police overtime. And we just wanted to get our arms around uh, the extent to which the request made sense within how the department operates. And so we hope that this analysis is helpful to you um, in evaluating that request. Thank you. Thank you very much and for the presentation. That's, uh, and Teresa, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. We'll, we'll hold our questions. Thank you for that. So the next, oh. Hello. The next item um, on the agenda, I believe, is the AAO. So let me just give you, um, I'll share my screen in just a moment. You can see my screen, yes. So I just wanna to bring to your attention, we met you know, on several occasions and since we've last met, we did add one more item to our AAO list and that is this green highlighted item for police reimagining. Um, we, that was initially appropriated with the adoption of the FY21 budget and it was slated to be funded by excuse me, the police asset forfeiture account, but looking at the criteria to use those funds, um, it doesn't appear that this is eligible. So um, we're reallocating it to um, the general fund. Again, initially it was a $200,000 approved um, allocation. Um, the price has increased by $70,000. So you'll see in the AAO, um, an allocation of $270,000 from the general fund um, for this reimagining process. So that is item B, 2B. Um, I don't know if Henry wants to um, speak a little bit about where we are on item 2C with the general fund revenues, just to give you an update. Yeah, I can do just a quick, um a refresh, we did a, a presentation about where we are at first quarter numbers when we close the first quarter. And we're trying, we're still in um, the, uh, month number two of the current fiscal, I mean, of the second quarter. And we haven't been able to get any more revenue numbers or projections from many of the, um, 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 uh, the professionals that sends us the, the projections that we have. And I know because of the um, new shelter in place, we got a call from ABNB that told us we, the projections number they gave to us, we need to, to stop it because they think that's, gonna, that's not going to be true again because with the new shelter in place, it's going to affect their numbers. And so we were, going to, we were going to stop. We were about to come up with a new projection number for the next second quarter. But now that that has stopped, so we couldn't, uh, the only numbers that we received was from the county which we just got yesterday. So we're putting that together so that we can come up with it, with a bigger, um, more projections to add. But we can, I can do a refresh of course, and because we sent it, we did that presentation November 12th. Let me, let me see if I can, I'll just share this, just go through it and see where we could find it there. I'll just share it so we can go through it and look at it again. I, can, I think this is it, this is it right here. So as of uh, first quarter, these are the declines that we had for the first quarter number that we closed as of September, July, August, September. 
we had the transit occupancy tax decline of 76%, short-term rentals of 86.3%, property transfer tax decline of 37.2%. We think there might be just um, timing difference. Uh, packing fines expected, we knew there was going to be declines. Sales revenue tax of 18%. We have utility users tax decline of 53 we have ambulance fees decline of 51.8, and we have interest decline of 27.5. So that's where we are. That's a snapshot of the first quarter. So now what we are trying to do is figure out where do we think um, we will be able to make a recovery out? How are we going to recover some of this? So the issue then became um, in terms of the big, in terms of the big numbers. So where were we really? It means we were about 15.7% quarter quarter number we look at last year first quarter where were we where did we land and this year's first quarter so we have a difference of 5.4 million bucks so the difference is about a 15.7 percent decline in our revenues looking at the quarterly numbers so first quarter of the fiscal year 2020 and the fiscal year 2021 there might be a couple of timing differences in them so we would think probably we will land about a five million dollar um, 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 real decline because we're looking at some of those numbers. But this just tells you the snapshot of the first quarter. Now, we're working on getting all the information for the second quarter. We're closing the, we're in November, we're in December, we're closing the November um, revenue year, month, and, and expenditure in about 10 days, which is on this, uh, by the 20th. So we, that would give us additional uh, um, um, data for us to be able to figure out, okay, so we now have five months of the month, where are we? And then we can start looking at how to generate the new projections to see where we are going to land. Um, but one of the good things that we received was from the property tax from the county yesterday, which they told us they are going to keep the AV, the assessed value that they had as of 1231, which is going to be the one that they generated the um, um, property tax that was due this month they're going to keep those numbers for this current fiscal year, which is good news. And the only thing they are going to do with that is they're going to look at it the way they did it last year, which is they're going to look at the projections in terms of the receivables. They're going to be able, they're going to adjust. They don't want to adjust the AV because it's already out. So, but they're going to look at, okay, is there going to be any impact in the receivables? Are we going to have, is the COVID going to impact people from paying their property tax? So we will adjust that revenue numbers, that projection numbers from those. So they are going to withhold six, they're going to decline the receivables by about 6%. Berkeley is typically good. We are at about 98, 99% receivables. So we think even with that, we should still be able to, there's still some, some funds that we should, we should be able to get. So we're working on getting that. Since we got that information yesterday that they are going to keep those projections, uh -uh. which is good. So since we know that we're going to, we might be upping the projections for that. That's the only good news that we have. Everything else is still in flux and we're still not sure about that. But the county gave us the, the, the certification that that revenue and the um, um, re, um, assets value that they use, they're not going to change those numbers. So that's good. So we're going to now revise anything that has to do with property tax revenue that is attached to it. We probably up it a little bit. So that would be some revenues coming in. Now, the issue then becomes, would we have enough of those revenues coming in to take care of the net revenues that we know are going to be declining? So that is where we need to come up with a, with a better projection. So if we get, just for instance, we get, we're going to add about 4 million bucks into the property tax revenue piece. So instead of having 61 million right here, we're going to have, we up it to about 65. Okay. But then if we get it to 65, how much are all the other declines that we're going to get from the TOT tax, from all the regular other taxes, how big of the numbers would we, would the $4 million be able to cover those? And that's what we're going to be doing the analysis once we close the month. And that is just to give you a snapshot of what we're doing, what we are going to come back to do. And once we close the month, this month, we'll come up with that projections. And then we will wait until the second quarter is done which is going to be the December 31. So by January 15, 17, when we close half the year, we will have a better, more, um, more details, more data to see whether we should, how we should fix the projections to we, and then we, could, we will be able to ask 
um, the hotels because they told us we need to wait. We'll have typically the city emails and calls the 10 biggest hotels in the city to come up with what's your TOT, what's your TOT projections, what, what are you looking at? And then they will be able to give us those numbers and the quarterly numbers, and then we'll be able to see what the projections should be going forward. But we just wanted to give you a snapshot of where we are and the good news we got from the county, and we're working on revising the, the projections as we get the numbers. With that, I will return it to um, uh, um, Teresa in case, but if you have any questions, we'll be here to answer. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I think that pretty much wraps it up again. Like Henry said, um, we're open to any questions. We did update the um, unfunded um, needs list um, with some information based on um, the presentation and updated information provided by the department. So that list has been updated. And um, Henry's discussion on the revenues um, will lead into the next item on the agenda um, when we talk about our general fund reserves. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now is, um, is first go to public comment and then we'll bring it back to council, uh, or sorry, the committee, and um, ask questions. Um, so if you have a comment on these items, so uh, excess equity, AAO, general funds reserve update, um, revenue update, uh, please raise your hand, uh, press the raise hand icon, uh, and I will call on you. Um, so I'm gonna go now to public comment and I see Kelly is- <laughs> Madam okay. Chair, can I clarify something if that's okay? Yes, I please. know that there are a number of people here to speak about a specific proposal that Councilmember Harrison will be putting forward today around um, addressing leaks at the Old City Hall and Veterans Building. Okay. I think this okay. would be the appropriate time for those, um, those members of the public to address that item. Okay, just so I'm clear. Because um, it's around the AAO and the um, yeah. excess um, equity allocations. Can I clarify? Yeah, please do. Was this referred yeah. from council or? No, it's not been referred. We're looking at deferring all of the excess property taxes that we use for capital. And we have realized recently in studies of Old City Hall and the Veterans Building that they have about a $100,000 need for immediate repairs to prevent further water intrusion. As that money that would normally be above the excess, the property tax above the 12 and a half million goes to capital. What I'm asking is, instead of deferring all of it, that we not defer 100,000 of it and use it for this very specific purpose. I see. Because resources that we don't fix now, capital resources, we're gonna have to pay more for later. And um, this came up in the whole course of looking at, at T1. It turned out it was not used, you could not use T1 funding for it for a variety of reasons. I hope Mr. Garland is here and can describe, but um, we're disappointed by that. And we need to do something to make sure these buildings don't end up in worse shape than they are in right now. And that, and, uh, Madam Chair, I, I became aware of this today. Members of the public had indicated they want to speak to it. So I just want to clarify that for the record. So I, there are, I know there are a number of people here to speak about specific proposals for uh, for the AAO. And I think we should just clarify, this is the public comment period for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. All right. So going to public comment, um, I will first go to Kelly Hammergren. You're al allowed to speak. Okay. So we're speaking... We're speaking now just on this item, not the presentation from David White. Have I got that correct? You can provide public comment on the three preceding items that were presented, the AAO, um, excess equity, and the general fund uh, uh, revenue, um, and what um, Councilmember Harrison just mentioned. Okay, can we reset my two minutes then? Sure. Um, so as far as what Kate Harrison is presenting, I think we, I really support that. Um, we also need the assessment on um, 
damage control for the two buildings uh, and repairs that that's needed. And I, I think that there's places that what Kate Harrison is presenting is the appro is appropriate and I support it strongly. Uh, then as far as the, the um, other presentations, I was especially interested in David White's presentation on the police department pushing the numbers around. Um, as some of you know, I have an MBA. I'm used to looking at numbers. And what I would say about the police department, it seems to be that no matter what is allocated, they're going to spend what they're going to spend. Um, and what we really need for the police department, instead of pushing numbers around, is that in this reimagining, we actually need an in-depth look at how officers are used. Do we really need 10 officers standing around looking at a crashed car, traffic car, like I saw yesterday, or four officers converging on a gentleman who's sitting on a wall? Uh, there needs to be a deep look at how staffing and assignments and calls and services and all that is put together with the police department. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all righty. Uh, so now we're going to go to um, Sherilyn Parsons. Uh, Yep. Hi. Hi. You are on. Yeah. So um, I'm director of the Bay Area Book Festival, and we're really grateful for the steady support over the years. I'm speaking to request the funding of the $50,000 grant that had been deferred from budget discussions in June. We had to shut down the festival this year when nearly all the work had been done to deliver it. That same week, we were about to post the full schedule of author events, exhibitors, and so on. We essentially had spent the grant that had been allocated to us by the city in the previous fall. Nevertheless, after some layoffs and restructuring, we worked hard to continue to serve the city. We were very happy to help with the Berkeley Relief Fund. We also produced Berkeley Unbound, which highlighted some of the city's most exciting writers and thinkers, including many of our local leaders. To give you an update, we're planning a nine day virtual festival from May 1st through 9th. Confirmed speakers so far include Nobel Laureate in Literature, Kazuo Ishiguro, he wrote Remains of the Day, um, and Michael Eric Dyson on the paperback of Long Day Coming, Reckoning with Race in America. If we're allowed to present an outdoor fair in the park or indoor events in our local venues in May, we will do so. Further, we had already expanded to year-round events even before the pandemic, with most of these events taking place in Berkeley. We hope to start presenting these in-person events in Berkeley as early as summer 2021, if advisable. The city grant is already factored into our budget. My worry is that without this funding, we won't make it past this May festival. After years of scrimping, we had finally built a small reserve to carry us after each festival until more funding comes in. We've now drawn it down. Further, we've had to convert some contractors to staff because of AB5. Most of our people live in Berkeley. We wanna to continue to serve Berkeley residents, feed the local economy and promote the city of Berkeley. The arts have been called second responders, helping communities process what's happened and recover. Thank you for your consideration amidst a really difficult time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um... Sounds very exciting. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, Never Let Me Go. Yes. <laughs> you go <real> <laughs> right. thank, you your, thank you for your comments. Sure. Okay, moving on to Lisa Bullwinkle. You are on. Good morning. Um, I want to support Kate's motion to provide some funding for uh, the Fix the Leak as we're calling it, fund for the Veterans Building and Old City Hall, so that they're not uh, demo so that demolition by neglect doesn't occur while we're in the last stages of the planning process to get these buildings up and running again for the community. And uh, it is very important that we get some funding to just kind of 
patch some holes in there, get them fixed while this great committee that we formed of concerned citizens from all walks of um, intelligence and backgrounds and knowledge come together to get these buildings up and running for the community. So thank you so much. And that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Um, moving on to Kim. Kim, you are on, Kim Johnson. Hi, good morning. My name is Kim Johnson. I'm with Bananas in, um, and we serve families in Northern Alameda County, including Berkeley, of course. And I am um, responding to the request for funds to provide personal protective equipment, PPE and air purifiers for the childcare providers in Berkeley. Um, as you all know, childcare is essential and there is no economic recovery without childcare. Uh, we are already in a very dire state where because of the pandemic, we are losing many childcare providers. Um, those that still remain though are on a financial cliff. They are experiencing extraordinary losses in income of 50% and more. Yet during that same time, their expenses have increased um, astronomically. And um, so this would help offset some of the costs that they incur and also keep them safe and to keep the children in their care safe. So the PPE, there's extensive cleaning that's required um, more so than had been in the past. And that's a cost that they, um, it's hard for them to find supplies and protective equipment and to pay for it. And then also while the kids are in their care to have air purifiers in the home these are highly efficient filtered air purifiers to keep the air circulating, especially as uh, the weather is turning cooler and they're able, they're not able to spend as much time outside as um, they would like. So I would uh, please ask for your support of this very important um, help for the child care providers. They're trying to be there for us. So let's be there for them. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for your service to our community. Okay, moving on to um, Leela. Leela, you are on. Hi, I'm Leela Moncharsh, and I'm uh, here today as a board member of the Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association, and, and we're supporting Kate Harrison's request uh, back on February 4, 2019, I sent a letter to the City Council on behalf of Baja talking about its significance, and I went back to read that letter today. Uh, i bring up a couple of things to kind of remind you about what we said uh, over a year ago. They designated the City Hall as a landmark in 1975, and in 1980, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places Inventory. The city designated the Veterans Building as a landmark in 1985. And I quoted from Susan Cerny, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Some of you remember her, um, a very good architectural historian. She wrote the following, across the nation, city halls were deliberately intended to be symbols of place, their domes or cupolas rising above the surrounding buildings. In Berkeley, Old Hall continues to be identified as a symbol of the city and remains a source of civic pride. Its cupola and spire are the city's equivalent to the University's Benelli. When Berkeley City Hall was completed in 1909, its cupola rose above the existing downtown and reflected Berkeley's growth from a town to a uh, This is probably one of the most important uh, items that is on your agenda uh, in a lot of ways because it's so important for us to have uh, and preserve these two buildings. So thank you very much to Council Member Harrison and we hope that this will come through and the property be at least for the time being preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to Carol. Carol, oopsie, I, I actually, uh, okay, here we go. Um, 
Carol, you are on. I support uh, the $100,000 for Old City Hall. We do not need any more emergencies to react to and respond to. Um, the time to do it is now. And we're, we're using that building currently. So we need to have these monies allocated. Uh, regarding the police overtime, um, I'd like to know more about how much of that overtime uh, was allocated because an officer was in the middle of a call or how much of it was because there was another officer uh, not on duty because they had called off or they were on leave. Um, I'd also like to see a balancing of has more additional positions we've been advised may become available. Are those positions going to be filled? Are they better responded to by overtime? Uh, because we need to look at a way to cut back these costs. If we are sincerely looking at the police reimagining process, which is going to be a prolonged process in the planning, we need to look now where uh, there is room to cut back and, and still provide proper public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all righty. Moving on to John Kaner, you are on. Hi, uh, John Kaner. I'm here in three capacities. Um, one is um, CEO of Downtown Berkeley Association. Uh, number two, I'm a neighbor. I live three blocks west of the park at Roosevelt and Alston. And three, uh, a member of community um, for Cultural Civic Center a group of over 40 citizens that is um, banding together to bring forward the Civic Center plan and vision that you've all approved. Um, I wanna thank Councilmember Harrison and urge your support for this $100,000 um, to uh, repair the water intrusion leaks in um, Old City Hall and Veterans Building. It is a very, very, very sound investment. Um, it will cost us much more if we don't do the repairs later and um, we're working with the team um, in um, helping uh, clarify and hopefully uh, getting a design preferred option uh, that you can all approve. Um, we've been working with tipping engineering on, the, on uh, refining some of the seismic analysis. And um, I really think this is a really sound investment for in, during really tough times. So uh, thank you. I might also just add, um, fully support the Bay Area Book Festival. Not only is the Civic Center the architectural soul of our community and what, all the great work that Baja and the Historic Society, but the book festival is part of our cultural soul. And uh, Sherilyn and her team have done an extraordinary job. It's a bit pretty minor investment to continue them here. And she's had a lot of other places in the city that have wanted the book festival to go. Um, and um, we really, what is more Berkeley than books? and the amount of intellectual um, growth and uh, learned and cultural diversity that she brings with the book festival and her entire team um, is a tremendous asset. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, our city auditor, um, you are on, I think. There you are, Jenny, you are on. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, um, yes, um, thank you so much for having these meetings. Um, I just wanted to say they're very valuable. Um, you know, where staff, uh, city staff can provide detailed information about the budget um, so that the committee can come together and that the public can also come together to have robust discussions. Um, it's even more important now with um, clear impacts, a fiscal impact from COVID-19. Uh, I also want to thank the um, finance director because I look forward to getting those finance estimates in January after the second quarter closes. Um, I just wanted to make um, a couple of quick comments. Um, one on the interfund transfer. Um, I, I just received the material, so I'll read it. Um, and digest it. But in general, if a policy increases fiscal responsibility and transparency, I'm in favor of that. Um, I do see here that it, there's a best practice that interfund loans should be short-term and not used to solve structural budget deficits. 
and that in general, having policies in place that lays out how borrowing and transfers work, um, you know, to replenish a fund when borrowed, like the general fund reserves replenishment, I think are um, those are important and good policies. Um, a second note on police overtime: my office is doing and um, uh, doing some work on the police uh, budget, and um, you know, I do appreciate getting this information and in the presentation that was made today. Um, we're still in the scoping phase and are aiming to produce this in the spring. Um, the presentation that was done today by David White, can I ask that, that those slides be made available to the public? Um, in general, it, is it possible to make these presentations available prior to the meeting so that council and the public can view the documents ahead of time? Uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, moving on to Arlene Silk. Uh, you are on. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Arlene Silk. I'm also here for Baja. I want to iterate what, what Leela Monchar said. And I was also on the Landmark Commission for 10 years, and I chaired the meeting in, at which City Hall was designated Landmark number one. And, and just to remind everybody, that City Hall was built by the same architects that, that later designed the, the beautiful San Francisco City Hall, which has been so beautifully restored. So I hard, hard, wholeheartedly support Council Member Harrison's request for $100,000 to protect that building and, and the Veterans Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to Andrea Pritchett. Um, you are on. Uh, thank you, uh, council members. And I'm sorry if <clears throat> I missed the presentation by David White, but I guess I just wanted to <clears throat> thank you for your examination of police overtime. And I guess I just wanted to share with you that, that, you know, during my time as a police review commissioner, I was there for two years and I was really trying to put forward this idea that what we needed was a performance audit within the police department so that we could actually understand what police officers are spending their time, their actual time doing. And I think with a, with a careful examination, you see, well, do you need a Lieutenant to staff the, you know, the evidence room? Is that really needed? You know, maybe there's a better somebody with that level of training and that who's, you know, sworn officer doesn't, and, and no, particular expertise in, you know, inventory management, maybe not a good choice. So these kinds of things I think are worth digging into. Um, I also think that I really struggled to, to get a clear answer from the chief about what is the criteria for staffing? How do you know how many officers you need? Is that based on population? Is that based on history? Is that based on crime levels? What is that based on? And actually a, a really good manager would say, well, what are your goals for the year? What are you trying to accomplish? So there's a management issue that dovetails, you know, and, and, and the lack of management, I believe, is what results in these incredibly, these blown out budgets, this incredible disregard for limitations on how much money you can spend on overtime. So I'm glad, you know, I, I think you're, I, I really appreciate your efforts. I hope it will lead to a, a deeper examination of the management and administrative practices within the police department. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then um, I believe I, my internet cut out when um, uh, former Mayor Tom Bates wanted to speak. Um, and uh, so I just, I, I noticed that he's still in the meeting and I was wondering whether um, Tom Bates, you wanted to make your comment now. Uh, I have uh, allowed you to speak if you would like to speak. Going once. <laughs> All right. So maybe uh, maybe your comments were provided uh, during uh, the agenda prior to that. So um, okay, that's all the public comment uh, that we have uh, for this particular item. So let's bring it back to council. Um, 
First, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Paul Budenhagen, um, who said uh, that he wanted to be able to provide some clarity with Liam on uh, the City Hall. So um, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Chair Drosty. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we okay. can. Uh, hopefully, Liam had uh, an urgent conflict, so I'm not sure if he's still um, listening in and available he, to- He's in the attendees. <laughs> He's in the attendees, but I think he had to step out. We could, if you could promote him to a panelist, and maybe he could, if he's there, he can speak to it. And if not, I can um, just pinch hit a tiny bit. Yes, I did see his. Oh, he's he's a panelist now. Um, so, uh, Liam. Oh, good. There he is. Okay. There you are. Um, I, think so I, th I think Liam has been looking at this, the, these issues a little bit um, and, and talking to folks, so might be able to shed some helpful light. Um, though we don't have a ton of information yet and thought it would be good to give him a chance to speak on it. Um, so if that's okay. Please do. Good morning, um, committee members. Uh, uh, I'm Liam Garland, Public Works Director. Uh, and yes, we've, we've been aware of the issue of these leaks um, uh, in these two buildings. Uh, well, I'm committed, um, or I've been committed to trying to find this $100,000 um, to start the feasibility study. Uh, we first got to determine where the leaks are coming from so that we can get to the source of the problem. And while that might sound easy, it's going to mean ripping down some walls and getting in and doing a, a really thorough investigation. And so for the, the two buildings, we think a, a $100,000 is about right up for that. Um, I do want to just clarify uh, something, which is that that feasibility study will identify the true costs of repairing the actual leaks, but the repair number is likely to be significantly more than that. We, we don't know until the feasibility study uh, is finished, but it, it might be in the range of $900,000 um, in terms of the actual repairs. Obviously, the, the feasibility study is to start to uh, at least get us farther uh, down the uh, down the road. Does that all make sense? Well, so is this uh, uh, is this feasibility? Can you talk more about this feasibility study? Is that what what uh, the request is, Councilmember Harrison, to fund that feasibility study? Yes, it is. And so, um, so can you speak to that, uh, Liam? Is this something that? Or anyway, I'll just I'll let I'll let um, actually I'll let you answer. Liam, and then we'll go to Kate so she can talk about it more, or Councilmember Harrison, yes. Uh, yes, so the, the feasibility study will help identify the true source of the leaks um, and help design the repairs that will stop the leaks in the future. Um, and so this is a study that is not programmed in our current budget. Um, uh, and um, uh, obviously, you know, from the public works perspective, yes, we, we want uh, the leaks to stop. Um, uh, and so it, it makes sense from being good stewards of our buildings. Um, it's just a matter of the uh, finding the money in order to support the work. Got it. Thank you. Councilmember Harrison, I'm going to hand it over to you. Since okay. We're about this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that we did uh, talk with uh, both directors of parks and public works about any other available sources. And um, we don't really have, as I understand it, a sort of building maintenance fund into which we put money for ongoing upkeep of our buildings. Is that correct? There isn't a, a fund somewhere else that is for this. Uh, not exactly. The, the, um, the, there is a general fund transfer that goes into these kinds of capital repairs, but given the volume of our buildings and the amount of needs in those buildings, that amount is far short of what's needed. Um, and so, and we, uh, to underscore, underscore council member your point, what we don't have is a 10 year plan for capital repairs that then is built into a rate that is charged out to the department users of those buildings that would then fund that work on a regular annual basis. Correct. And we started doing that, I believe with private renters of our buildings. So many different organizations that rent public buildings, we have started to charge them such a fee, I believe, but we haven't done that with our own department. So we lack a source and we uh, really try to use T1. There's difficulty with using T1 because of the phasing. 
and the demands for those funds. Um, what about the excess um, capital funding that comes off the top of the excess property tax, the amounts over 12 and a half million? Do you share in those revenues on an annual basis? Is there any funding there allocated to you already from past years? I don't have it a hundred percent certain answer to that. I don't believe that public works uh, currently has any work being funded through those allocations. But okay. that is not a hundred percent certain answer. Okay. I think maybe for the next budget cycle, it'd be great to know where the additional amount over the 12 and a half million has been going for capital, just so we can get a pattern of that. But I'm talking about June, not, not right now. So um, in any event, uh, we tried to explore with this group many, many sources, and this is where we've ended up. It's obviously dry right now. It's a good time to do this study and try to understand more about the status of these buildings. And I, I just don't want to lose this historical treasure. Thank you. That, that helps clarify the, the, this particular topic. So I appreciate that. Um, okay, so now why don't we delve into the various presentations? Um, we had quite a uh, quite a series, and thank you, Liam, for for that clarity. That was helpful. Um, why don't we we dive into these presentations and ask our questions, provide initial comments? Um, I would also like to reiterate what our city auditor asked to put um, these presentations, particularly the fascinating police overtime presentation with the slides on the budget and finance uh, website, please. That would be very helpful uh, for the community. And um, first I'd like to hand it over to the mayor to begin his initial questions and comments on these presentations. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanna thank David White um, and all the staff that worked to develop that presentation on police overtime historically and what went into their assumptions around what overtime needs are for this fiscal year. I thought it was really excellent. And I'll spend some time this weekend pouring over it um, as part of the uh, discussion of the request of $5 million from the department. Um, I did have some specific questions though related to overtime and, and police staffing. Um, I don't know if Chief Greenwood is on the call or if David can answer them. Hi, Chief. Um, do you know what the minimum staffing is for, I guess, for Berkeley Police Department patrol? Is there a, is there, is there sort of a minimum number that we need to meet? Yes, the, the minimum staffing. So we have, uh, we have 16 beats. Uh, and the coverage for that is for 16 officers, four supervisors, and a commander uh, during most hours. Uh, the schedule... Um, there's some detail in the schedule because we have one schedule Monday through Thursday and another Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But at a high level, uh, we want one officer for each beat at all times uh, and uh, two supervisors per team. So uh, you would have two supervisors uh, during the uh, low, uh, the low, lowest staffing period, which is after, which is roughly speaking, after 2 a.m. until 10:30 or 11 a.m. every day is when we are in an eight-beat system. Uh, so with eight beats, we have eight officers, two supervisors, and a watch commander to cover most of the hours, not the uh, two to 6 a.m. hours. Uh, and then as the city goes to a 16 beat system, uh, which generally speaking is about 11 a.m. until uh, 2 a.m., we have 16 beats. So we staff with overtime to fill those 16 beats, those four supervisor positions and a watch commander position. Uh, with the comm center, we um, staff to six, uh, and the, the functions there are, we have a police desk, a fire desk, two call takers, and a warrant desk, and then a sixth employee who works, um, takes up whatever desks need to be, uh, who rotates through desks so that everybody can get their breaks. Uh, in dispatch, there's a, uh, there are two uh, shorter breaks and one lunch break for every shift, so you have one uh, essentially one position there that's that's covering. Uh, dispatch staffing does go down, I believe by one position um, in the in the uh, early morning hours or late late night, early morning hours uh, to five. And then we have three, um, we, in our jail operation, we have three positions that we fill. Um, so if somebody is off for whatever reason, then we staff that with overtime. So those are our continuously running operations uh, and typically involved in the um, 
the um, uh, shift the minimum staffing needs. What's that? What's the average number? Because you know it. You said it varies depending on the number of days, but like, what's the average number? The number is well um, on a daily basis. Uh, generally, it's sixteen from 11, 16. 11 in the morning until uh, about two in the morning. Sixteen okay. beats. Uh, and eight during the lesser times. There is uh, there is a different schedule for the Thursday, uh, sorry, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the weekend team who work a 12 and a half hour shift. So it, it's slightly different. Um, and I can provide you with, with that information, but conceptually uh, it's the same. We, we uh, fill our beats and if we need uh, overtime, if, if we have absence in a, in a uh, beats not staffed for whatever reason, then we have sold overtime to cover that. Uh, and we make sure we have supervision in place and a commander um, during a most about 20 hours a day uh, for um, uh, general responsibility for the entire city. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I just had also some questions around one of the slides in the chart and Mr. White sent it to me and I wanna thank him, I'm gonna pull this up. This is the historical, it's on the screen, the historical overtime overview. Yes. So, the, so for fiscal 20, we're at, um, 7.6, um, which is less than where we were in fiscal um, 18, um, where in fiscal 18 was, I think during the calendar year 2017, where we had the, the, the a whole year of events, um, unpermitted events. So I'm, I'm curious as to why our overtime costs are greater this year when we had, well, up until recently when we had more staffing than we did in 2017 and less um, special events. Um, do you have any sort of insights as to the, the, the difference in, in amounts? Um, is it COVID? What, what are some of the factors? Well, some of the factors- Chief, Chief, if you want, I can pull up one of the charts we have that you could talk from that has some of the hours laid out. Okay, I, I unshared my screen so you can share your screen. Okay. Why don't you just share the screen, Chief, while you talk? All right. So um, uh, the graph that you had up, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, increase in terms of um, fiscal 20. Um, we uh, were staffing uh, plainclothes operations. We uh, were staffing uh, a downtown and telegraph. And we were doing staffing. We were staffing overtime seven days a week to try to meet the needs of um, the concerns that were rising out of uh, downtown and telegraph. Um, the graphic that you had on the screen, Mr. Mayor, um, was an overall. And one of the things that's increased that uh, is shown in, uh, in one of the other graphics, but it's in the presentation, is the um, a work for private parties. Uh, so that is showing up there. That has increased this year. And that is fully reimbursed by the private parties. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, our staffing, um, uh, staffing and staffing drops. We're we are um, uh, concerned about uh, concerned about that. So um, why are we including hours that are reimbursed by private entities? It does. And I guess my my second follow up right. question to that is, Mr. White or Chief Greenwood, is the five million dollar number that you have costed out in the unfunded needs? Does that encompass reimbursable overtime? Because that seems like we're kind of double counting. Because if it's going to be reimbursed, why are we allocating general fund revenue for something we're going to get money for? Yeah, so we looked at that, and that you know th that was one of the things we spent a lot of time on. So the way that uh, we account for the revenue, and it's a great question, um, the way that we account for the revenue is it doesn't actually flow into the department. So the department itself is just purely expenditure. So the estimates that we came up with actually exclude uh, the uh, hours that are going to be attributable to the reimbursable services. And we also do not attribute the revenue because it's just not how it flows uh, into our accounting system and into the department itself. So the department is not able to take credit for the revenue. Uh, they're only uh, recognizing expenditure. So yeah. that's really why, you know, in terms of looking at the request, because it doesn't account, the estimates we produce don't account for that. It seems fairly reasonable um, what they're asking for. 
Well, and I think, you know, given COVID-19, we're probably going to have very few special events this next year. So that should reduce that line item. Um, unless, I mean, that special events, does that encompass demonstrations, free speech events as well? Yes. Okay. Um, but well, in we, we, we may have more, less, less special events this year. So that's something to factor into as part of the, um, and I guess is that, I'm looking at, is that exhibit eight, Mr. White? Yeah, if you look at exhibit eight, okay. that special event line item there is really focused on those events that would be the more typical reoccurring ones. And that ties to exhibit six above. Uh -huh. um, and that number based on averages yields a cost or an expenditure need of about $120,000, $125,000. Got it. So the big, the big ticket item is minimum, the, the, the minimum OT amount needed for insurance patrol. Patrol. You want to jump in too? Yeah. Well, I think patrol communication center in jail. Got it. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, this process is, um, uh, this is the, the first time I'm aware of that there's been a deep dig into uh, the overtime and the breakdown um, as complete as being presented today. Uh, and it's been a, um, a good experience to break into that data, working with uh, David and our um, our fiscal services manager. Uh, and we've uh, seen there's a, an opportunity to um, give some focus to uh, our coding uh, and um, especially where uh, the overtime coding um, uh, where overtime has been coded uh, as uh, minimum staffing. And what we want to do, what I am doing is initiating a, an internal audit to look at uh, what specifically the reasons for those overtime expenditures are fiscal year 21 to date. So we'll be looking very closely at that, look for opportunities to ensure that um, our overtime slips are being coded properly, which means they would yield the um, most accurate data for you know, your consideration. Uh, for an understanding of the cost of uh, uh, managing events, for example, uh, and if there's opportunities for us to um, uh, that could rise to reduce uh, reduce over time as well. Thank you. Yeah, I I think this analysis is extremely helpful. It's the first time I've seen it. Um, my time on the council, and um, uh, you know, I, I just have to say that we have a lot of demands that. Um, both are in the AAO and in the unfunded list. Council requests are not as significant as the administrative requests. Um, we just heard from Henry, we're assuming, you know, revenue reject reductions next fiscal year, which we're going to have to, uh, have to bake into whatever uh, decision we make on Tuesday. Um, and so uh, we're gonna have to balance all these things. And $5 million is a lot of money. And so I just want to, I want to make sure that we are budgeting the amount that's necessary um, because that's going to come at the expense of other things which the community needs as well. So I just I, I wanted to just make that comment and you know I, I'm, I'm going to need the weekend to kind of go over all this information um, so that we can you know have an informed discussion on Tuesday. Um, so I thank you chief that's very helpful I appreciate that information. And I'm available to you uh, all weekend. Uh, should there be specific questions that I can help with or you need further information, anything I can provide. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have a question for Ms. Berkeley Simmons. What is the total um, amount that the city manager is requesting in, um, in AA01 now that um, it's been adjusted? Let me see. Give me a moment. Um, so, um, in the AAO one, we're requesting the seven. Oh, can you see my screen? I just want to make sure you can see it. Uh, it's kind of, can you zoom in a little bit? Yes. Let's see. Does that Great. help? Okay. Yes. Great. So we're looking at, um, included in the AAO one is the 7.19 and this 8.786. Okay. 
And then the unfunded asks, according to the spreadsheet I saw, um, so I'm just trying to get all this paper. Um, there's 15.9 million in addition to that in unfunded unfunded asks for um, fiscal 21. Yes, um, so unfunded I had, needs. So. I had a question around the homeless response team line item. It says 815.729. I know that there are certain things in the AAO to help implement the homeless response team. Are those out, are those appropriations in addition to the 815.729, or is or are they included in that number? I believe the 815 is in addition to the items that are requested in the AAO. That was my question. Okay. Um, and some of these things, I'll just have to say, we have to do. We don't have a choice. Um, the F FLSA, we are legally mandated to do that. Um, parking funds, we have a $3.2 million deficit. Um, the cybersecurity, that's extremely important as we're working remotely. Um, the building fund deficit, I appreciate the additional analysis that was done based on my questions to look at refining that number. Um, I do believe that we do need to fund the vacant positions in the fire department. Um, we have a number of vacancies right now due to COVID-19 um, and being deployed to fires and other events. And it is really having a significant impact on the department, um, on morale, um, and on their ability to provide service to our community. And I think we have to address that just as we are committed to police staffing. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, you know, adding up the things that I accounted for, that's like 11.9 million. Um, uh, if we, I, I don't think we can fund the section 115 trusts now, to be quite honest with you. Um, so I'm just trying to get a sense of what is potentially available so the excess property transfer tax revenue, the 9.188555, that, that, that line item is assuming that that goes into, that whole 9.1 goes into the capital improvement fund? So normally that total amount would be transferred to the capital improvement fund, but you can absolutely take a holiday to address these um, unfunded priorities. So that 9.188 is is available for yes. allocation. That's yes. extremely helpful to know because I think that's the only way we're going to get to yes. a realistic budget to address these these unfunded needs, which I do believe are necessary to fund. Um, we're going to have to fund overtime in some amount. There's no question about that. I'm not sure yet what that amount is, and I want to do some okay. additional analysis. And but we're going to have to fund something. There's no question about that. Um, I know I'm jumping jumping ahead, but then we're going to discuss shortly the idea of um, potentially taking 2.3 million of that 9.188 and putting that into paying back the reserves. And so we got to think about that as well um, and how that factors into the whole picture. And I don't I think we have no choice to, you know, we're going to have to at some point soon, we're going to have to, you know, pay back the, the 11 million that we had drawn on because we're gonna need that probably, we might need that next year. We might need that the year after um, to address a pandemic or a fire or an earthquake. And we have to be positioned to be able to, to sustain city operations. So that's also a priority that we're gonna have to really think about. We'll have that conversation shortly. Those are all my questions, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the staff for your incredible work. Um, we have a lot of things we're dealing with right now, <laughs> including addressing a public health emergency. The level of information is extremely helpful. And Henry, I guess I had a question. Um, that chart that you shared with us, is that going to council? The, or is that is that a, a document we've seen previously that had the um, the estimated reduction in, in revenues? Yes, we sent it to the budget 11-12. Uh, that was the presentation I gave. Excellent. And I will go back and review that very closely because that's, I think, one of the most important things that we have to think about yes. is how much do we need to set aside for assumed reductions in revenues? Um, otherwise, we're going to have to just go back and redo all this in a few months. So there's that factor. We also know that we're going to the table soon. So there's a lot of things, additional things that we're have to, we have to consider. And it, to that end, 
we're not going to be able to do everything. So we have to just be realistic. And Madam City Manager, um, uh, uh, I think we're meeting tomorrow, but um, I, uh, I may reach out to you over the weekend to touch base with you with respect to the budget. So, Absolutely. okay, thank you. Thank you for indulging. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Harrison. Yeah, I have questions in, in four different areas. First of all, I wanted to ask Henry, I just wanna be sure I'm clear. I'm the, I think I understand from what the mayor just said. We have not budgeted this assumption that we're going to be $5.4 million down in revenue. And we don't know the number is even going to be that because of the property tax. Is that right? We have not accounted for that in these numbers. No, the, the, this is just the first quarter. We just got that revenue, that number yesterday. So if you want to just subtract 5.5 5, 5, 5, 5 million and, and add in 4 million, so we're in the red by one. If I change the projection based on that, just that number I got yesterday. Yes. And is it your advice that we should do that now or wait until after the conclusion of the second quarter? Because I take the mayor's point about not continually redoing the budget, but I didn't know if you were securing these numbers or you wanted to wait. No, I mean it's it's a number they gave to us and they certified it, so it's we 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 can do it now, but we can wait as well, whichever. But it's a satisfied number that they said this is what we built, this is what we the the projections would be. They actually gave us their projections and told us how much they're going to build on our behalf, so we can use that. And they just said what we need to do is just the. The difference would be how much do we receive back? So the, your, your number is going to be flat. It's going to be this. We're then going to take 6%. So we're going to use that to now revise our number. They gave us the number that we use for the June budget. So now they're revising it. So we can revise it as well. So they gave us the number for the June budget. By taking that now, they gave us a revised budget and say we're going to keep the, the revisions that we have and we're going to keep it. So we can do the same thing on our books because they're doing the same thing for them. So I'm no, I'm not concerned about that. I'm just more concerned about the right. ones that are that we don't know about. That's right, and you don't know that right now anyway. So making an adjustment right now wouldn't really make sense. I think yes, it's just, be, just be projecting based on. Okay, yes. that was that answers that question. Thank you. I wanted to say yes to a policy for interfund transfers. I thought that was excellent. No one else has touched on that yet. On um, number three, I wanted to ask a question of Teresa about the updated unfunded needs, the ones we just got. I think last night, and thank you again for all this work. Do you have that chart? I think there was an, an update to that. You want me to pull it up or you want yeah. to make sure? Okay, yeah. hold on. Yep, yeah. just give me a moment. Thank you. Okay, so what is new here? I guess is what I'm not understanding from yesterday. Um, from yesterday. Um, so from the last or meeting. The last time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, let's see. So this ninety-two um, thousand dollars that was reduced for the projected um, building purchase and maintenance. So that number was reduced. Okay. So that number is new. And this number for the uh, request, funding request for the fire positions, that number is new. Okay. Okay. And um, I think that's it on this list. Um, we talked about the marina. This was being charged the special fund, so that's a zero now. Okay. And there was a um, a request to advance funding for T one. Um, for the mental health building that's going to be funded by a special fund. So that's not included on this list now. So this list has been updated. These numbers are the same. Um, yep, the new numbers are, would be this 92,000 okay. and this $541,000 request. Okay, just so the public knows the 92,000 is a reduction. So it's a new replacement number of something that used to be much bigger, correct? Correct, that's so correct. 500,000 you went and re-examined that. So that's, that's correct. Good. Thank you very much. Can you go back up just a little? Sure. I have one more question on this and that's on the, um, I'm, I'm a little lost still on the operational needs for the parking funds. Does this mm -hmm. include an assumption that we are doing 100% of the parking meter replacement? Because we got an answer from uh, Mr. White that said we might be able to stretch that over two years. So I don't know if that 3.2 includes that or doesn't include it. 
Um, I'll, I'll defer to um, Mr. White, but I believe this does not include that $6 million for the capital tied to the meter fund. So we would have to budget for that um, if you want to do it over two year period in fiscal year 22, fiscal year 23. Okay. Where is that budgeted right now? I thought it had been budgeted somewhere. It, ha it had been budgeted before, but um, if they defer that, this brings um, the unfunded uh, amount down to this $3.2 million. Oh, that includes, that's my question. That includes the assumption of deferral. Great. Okay. So that number also shifted from the last meeting? Not from the last meeting, no. From uh, the initial meeting, the first meeting, yes. Okay. Let me, let me ask Mr. White this thing, because I'm, I'm really confused on this. <laughs> sure. Point, and it's a lot of money. So um, we had asked in questions to you that you then answered for all of us. Thank you for that. Whether or not we could defer or stretch out the time for the parking meter replacement. This 3.2 number of the deficit is the same as what we saw last time. And I thought it assumed spending all the money we needed for the parking meter upgrade so the public knows so that we can accept credit cards on our parking meters, which is important to our revenues. I thought this number included doing it all at once. And now in your responses, you've said, maybe we can stretch that out. Is, is that correct? Where are we showing that adjustment, this maybe we can stretch that out adjustment? Anywhere? Or do we have another bit of money available? I'm trying to find out. So I, I appreciate the question because it's a good opportunity to maybe um, clarify any confusion and uh, hoping Liam is also here as well. So the 3.2 million is what is needed to uh, support operations in fiscal year 21 what uh, we brought forward to the budget and finance committee some meetings ago was a proposal for a balancing plan that um, is a blend of uh, use of reserves deferring some capital projects and then uh, really uh, as a last resort bringing in the general fund to help support the operations and that's the 3.2 million the ramification of uh, using our reserves is that we're using funds that had been set aside to support the future replacement of the meters uh, in the future. And uh, what was brought forward by the Public Works Department was a proposal to smooth out the funding needs over a few different years. And that's how we get to the 3.355 number in fiscal year 22. Um, I'll defer to Liam on the specifics of when the capital project has to happen. Can that be spread out over a couple of different years? But I hope that sort of clarifies the genesis of the numbers you're seeing on the spreadsheet. Showing zero right now in 21, assuming we're not doing it right now. And so therefore we've accounted for it in that way. And then you're showing 3.3 million next year. Is that correct? Yes, the 3.3 million for next year is to help uh, build up the reserves that are needed uh, in order to execute that capital project, let's call it in fiscal year 23. Okay, okay, so this has all been accounted for in here. Okay, great, thank you. That was my, those are all my questions on the expenditure side and thank you again for all your, your work on this. Um, okay, now I wanna to turn to the police budget. I know no surprise to anyone. <laughs> Um, council member, I I'm sorry. I just want to make sure there's one thing I forgot to tell you. We did remove the paramedic tax allocation from the spreadsheet oh. as well. So okay. just so you'll know. Great. Okay. Thank you. you. Get this in email with the highlighted changes, just because Absolutely. I'm having a hard time tracking from one document to the next. And I was caught up and now I'm not. <laughs> now I don't know where I am. Thank you. That'd be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now I'm turning to police overtime. As you know, I made this request in June that we have a quarterly report on police overtime. And that request included a few things, one by category, which you've really helpfully done. So regular overtime versus special event, et cetera, versus special response. Um, another request we have was by rank, and I don't see that here. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And I'm hoping we can in include that in the future. Um, we definitely need to do something about right-sizing this for salary increases. I mean, I think what we've been doing is saying, leaving the number constant at this 2.3 and saying, well, we'll find savings somewhere else and we'll apply it to make up for these salary increases. I think we have to right-size that no matter what else we do. So that brings that budget to 3 million, 
roughly, no matter what. Okay, so we definitely have to add the 600,000 that Mr. White referenced as being the cost of salary increases that were applied to regular salaries, but not applied to overtime. So that's that's sort of the first factor. And I'm hoping we'll just agree that we have to do that because we should have done that. And it, it's the correct thing to do. Even if we're just spending the same hours of overtime, it should have gone up by 600,000. Um, I do have to say that I don't think using past numbers to predict the future is really the best way to go here on the non-patrol because one of our questions is why is it so high? So we're overspending by $5 million and we're saying, well, on average, we've overspent by $5 million. That doesn't really answer the exact question. And there's a big bucket of this other where you had the non-patrol where you said, we'll just use the averages. I guess I want a deeper dive into that. And I'm not expecting that by next week, but just so you know, I'm going to be curious about that number. I'm not really going to just say that's what it was historically. Um, can you hold on just one second? I have to ask someone to not make noise. Hold on. Okay, it's going to be noisy. <laughs> um, so that's one question I have. Also on those charts where you show by category, you show the hours, you know, where you had the like 300 hours for this and 500 hours. For that. I want to see that in dollars. I'm having a hard time translating the hours to dollars. Um, and um, I think that would be a very helpful data point, Mr. White, if you know what I mean. The several charts where you showed, here is how the hours have changed. I'd like to see how the dollars have changed. Um, does that make sense? I hope. Um, and um, I also uh, think that we need to, to um, deal with the um, issue on the patrol because that is at the heart of our reimagining public safety. That's exactly what we're looking at right now is how much police response we should have to things versus other things. And that leads me to this question. What I would have seen in, in when I worked in San Francisco is a kind of reserve fund we're changing things right now. And we're saying right now we're spending 5 million more than what we spent in the past, in, over, historically. We're spending this extra money. We would like to have the extra money allocated. At the same time, we're making changes in practice. I'd like to see if we can reserve part of that funding. And I don't know how that works in Berkeley, but it seems to me that I wanna see the results of the auditor's study and some of the other analyses that are going on for reimagining before allocating all that money and also ask that there be more effort put into management controls of overtime. So you don't have to address this right now, but just know I'm, gonna, I'm interested in how we, if we do have a way of reserving funding, that's a technique we could use. Um, so the other question I had is, if, I'll get back to the rank question for a minute. I know there was an earlier FMLA decision, Fair uh, Labor, FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act decision said, we should give overtime to lieutenants when they work overtime, that it's not comp time. That only answers the question about how they are compensated when they do in fact have to work. It does not answer the question, why do we have so many lieutenants working overtime? And I, I think this is a specific thing that I wanna see. These are management positions and I would expect that to be a very limited thing. Uh, it goes along with the patrol and I understand you have supervisors with patrol and the command and all that. But I'm hoping within patrol, we can look at the rank of people and see if we can control some of those costs on the upper ranks um, doing overtime. And um, I see if I have any other introductory questions. Um, also, I would ask that we not round up. You're showing a historical average of four and a half million over and saying we need five. We're in a real fiscal bind. We don't have the extra $500,000 to give you. So we need to stick with the numbers that we that are actual and no, not round. Um, and um, trying to see if I have anything else. Oh, I have one comment about reimbursable. And this is just a personal observation. While it is true, we get the money back from the people that are reimbursing us. That officer is now maybe a little more tired and a little less available to us and a little less able to do overtime on our behalf. And I am worried about the fact that reimbursable number is going up because it says we are allowing our officers, which we should, to do overtime elsewhere. But I'm wondering what the impact is of that on their 
uh, tiredness and on our ability to use them for overtime for the patrols we've set up, for example, the downtown patrol and the telegraph patrol. As I understand it, and again, you don't have to answer this right now, but I'd, I'd like to know by next week. As I understand it, officers are allowed to bid for overtime, specific slots. In other words, they don't just say, I wanna work Tuesday. They say, I wanna work Tuesday at this event or in front of this store. And I wanna know if that's true because that Tuesday they chose that, maybe a Tuesday we really need them downtown. And I'm oh. just gonna tell you, the merchants are feeling still so vulnerable. And I know we're doing everything we can, but we need people to not be tired working privately so they're available to us is my basic. Right, I mean, we, we control the, the um, reimbursed overtime uh, on 4th Street, for example, if there are a situation where, where we have uh, overtime needs elsewhere, um, those are prioritized, just as we can um, pull somebody who's on, a, um, on that detail if we need to. Uh, so we're, we're controlling for that. That's not occurring. In terms of signing up, we, I mean, the procedure is we uh, post, uh, post overtime and people uh, sign up for it so people can see a list of available slots and they sign up for it. But um, uh, we're very careful about overtime, um, operationally needed overtime, not going unfilled because an officer is working this other overtime. Okay. The priority is the operational needs and we attend to that. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see how that, that works. And then, um, oh, I did have another question. Why is the special response time for overtime going up? What's this, the special response team? And again, I'm not expecting team? answers to all this right now. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at, or we'll be looking at. It is very likely related to um, uh, them being active in terms of ser serving high-risk search warrants. So, for example, um, with uh, where we have an arrest or a search warrant involving uh, a dangerous suspect and weapons and guns, uh, the special response team is tasked with uh, serving those. And um, I. Um, I am going to be looking at, I think they've been more active. We've had more shootings, more gun cases, more gun recoveries okay. in the past, well, this year and in the past years. Um, and I, I am going to confirm that that's what's going on there. Okay. So when we do a search warrant on a, on a gun suspect, uh, a shooting suspect, a murder suspect using the special response team, that's a lot of people gathered for several hours to get that accomplished safely, get the suspect taken in custody safely. Okay. Okay. No, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then I, it's, I have a question for um, Teresa, actually. You had this really helpful chart in an earlier presentation that showed kind of a yes, no answer, which was, was the overtime that was needed over what had been budgeted, did it come out of the police department? And it showed no, not all of it. No, no, yes, totally made up for by the police staffing shortages and no, no. So 18, we made up that percent. So it'll show like, 2018, it was over by 285%. And then the next column, do you know this chart I'm referring to? Said, did we get all of this out of the police department or do we have to turn to the general fund, the general general fund? Mm -hmm. okay. And there was one year where we did get all of that out because that was our lowest staffing year. Mm. Here's my request. I, I kind of think a yes, no answer isn't that helpful. What I would like to know is, if overtime went up 285% in a given year, how many dollars was that? Of those dollars, how many came from the police? And then how much came okay. from the general, general? And the reason for that is we have to account for the fact when we have vacancies, we're gonna need to have overtime to make up for these vacancies until we reimagine policing and maybe redo some of these things. And that's at time and a half. And I can't look at that table with just a yes, no answer and understand that. So I'm interested in what amount it is dollars, what of those dollars came from the police budget, what part of the police budget did it come from salaries or other, you don't have to be more specific than that, the personnel or other, and of the overage, how, how many dollars is that that we had to take from somewhere completely different, okay, because that'll help us, I think, look at this whole pattern. And I recognize we're not going to solve this by Tuesday. <laughs> so what I'm looking for for Tuesday is an understanding of what we can do in terms of reserving funds while we are reinventing our process, um, a better understanding of the expenditures by rank, and a, a redo of the charts that show hours by type of overtime to be dollars. Uh, so Mr. White's chart, if that could be 
converted to dollars. I just, I need to think about everything in dollars because <laughs> if I have dollars and hours, it's, it doesn't match up, match up for me. Um, so. Those, those requests are reasonable. And um, I think it's going to be fairly straightforward for us. I already started moving in the direction of summarizing the hours by rank because I, I'm really eager to kind of do an analysis of taking actual hours and applying it to current hourly rates to see sort of what the budget looks like. And then on exhibit um, seven, I believe, in, in the memorandum, just for patrol, so not the totality of your request, there's a translation of hours um, into actual dollars based on the overtime um, that was used in that. But it's just for patrol. So it's not the totality of what you're asking for, just for that piece. Yes, um, but, but you can see that. Yeah. Okay, great. That's great. I, would, I just wanted to add the, um, in terms of special response team, I neglected to mention that when we have um, uh, uh, demonstrations uh, that uh, the special response team typically is responding to those as well. Okay. So where we have a, a more or, or prolonged demonstrations, um, you're going to see an increase in special response team um, being used. Okay, great. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to all this work unfolding over the next year. And again, my goals for right now are not as big as everything I just talked about, but it's to understand this picture better and to figure out a way to reserve funds while we are reinventing the process. Um, I had a question, one other question, and that has to do with where we reflect CARES and FEMA money in the budget. We're getting reimbursements from the federal and state government because of this COVID emergency. And I've still never quite understood, are they in here? Do they help with this deficit? Do they not? Have we accounted for them? And that answer may be different for all these different sources, but I, I think I need a little bit more tracking on that. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly answer because we, uh, we've looked into that a bit. So the one, um, piece that is definitely helping to support the budget is the uh, we received an allocation from the state of $1.5 million of CARES Act money. We, um, because it was eligible, we applied the small business grant programs and art grant programs to that resource because those programs would not be uh, reimbursable under FEMA. So we we're trying to maximize uh, our reimbursement. That money is coming into the general fund and is treated, uh, if I read it correctly, uh, as a, a grant item or a state revenue item coming into the general fund as an other revenue source. So that's how it'll sort of show up. The other programs um, are federal programs and or state programs and our specific grants. So they're being tracked as grants are within the city and have their own specific project codes. And those resources, for the most part, are going to things like uh, our respite program, our disease containment unit that's doing disease um, contact tracing. Now they're being deployed to our vaccine response, um, our shower program, a lot of the services that are most vulnerable. And again, those are treated within the, the grant side of the ledger because they're all grants. Okay. I'm Nothing else is coming into the general fund. Okay. So on the one and a half million for the small business support, uh, I'm looking for balancing of revenues and expenditures. We've showed, we have staff that are doing these programs and we're paying them and that's part of our expenditure side. Do we show the revenue balancing of the one and a half? Is it included in these numbers? Is it in the well, numbers right now as other? That's a good question. So the challenge, there's a, just, it's just a timing issue for us. So our expenditures, so under the state CARES program, we were able to look back to March and expenditures had to occur by December. So we ascribed revenues that we collected, I think from July to October, which is they chunked them out over I think four to five months. And we, we allocated them to expenses that we incurred in fiscal year 20. So the expenditures for the grant programs went out in fiscal year 20, will be reflected in the fiscal year 20 financial statements. This revenue that is coming in is showing up in our fiscal year 21 um, general fund because that's when we receive the money. Is it already in there? Is it in Henry's chart? Is it in Henry's chart as a revenue source? Or are we not accounting for that? No, it, it should be in there now. We've recognized it. Um, 
And when I looked at one of the reports, I saw it in the general fund, so it should be there. Okay, I'd love to, yeah, later, if you could highlight where that is. And then the same thing with FEMA. Again, we have expenses, things happening, regular people that weren't on grants before, they did other functions that are also really needed by the city, but they've all been reassigned to the EOC. That same person's salary is now partly made up by FEMA. Have we shown those FEMA receipts in the revenue numbers? Sorry, did I break up? We lost you, David. David, we lost your audio. Sorry about that. I, I put it on mute, so... Uh... I wouldn't, um, anyway, uh, I'm technology world. Um, so no, uh, we still do not have our arms around all of the personnel expendit expenditures that we will be able to actually get reimbursed for. So we track in, uh, an individual's name, you may not have heard a lot of, but Eamon Reagan uh, has been the master of tracking our time by project, by staff, by department. And so we're working with AG WIT right now to peel through all that. And we wanna get as much of our personal expenditure, expenditure reimbursed as we can, but we do not have profile on when that will come in. So you're seeing the expenditures today, but we're not, we don't have a perspective yet on what revenues will come in. I couldn't with certainty tell you what percentage of that staff will get reimbursed and when we'll get reimbursed for it yet. Fine. It just gives me a slight comfort that there will be some reimbursement in there um, because we will have other revenue problems down the road. So when we look at that revenue chart and we say it's great the county's come through and said we're going to give you this, we're using the same basis for assessments. So our problem is 1.4 million. Our problem may not even be 1.4 million because we're going to get these other sources. We don't have them yet. It makes me more comfortable with Henry's answer that we don't have to worry right now about budgeting the revenue shortfall is where I'm going. Does that make sense? We can wait and see how this fluxes out. I hope I'm making sense. I'm, I'm not worried about doing that right now. I think the mayor was concerned maybe we should be showing that. And I don't think we have to because we have other things in play. We'll know more later. So that, that's why I've asked about that. And then I just want to go back right very quickly to my old city hall and <laughs> veterans building. We show a number of 9.188 in excess property taxes that we would normally allocate to capital. And we're saying we don't have to do that, but I want to take 100,000 of that for this purpose is what I'm, what I'm saying. I hope that can be reflected in the budget if, if my colleagues agree. And then we're also looking at, and I know it's the next item, two and a half million of that going to reserves. So is that accurate? About the two and a half? It comes out of the 9.188, right? Well, there's 1.6, which automatically goes per the formula. And then there's a proposal for an additional okay. 2.3, which we'll talk about shortly. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, those are my comments. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a few um, a few questions. Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank you again, and um, I have you know I will be digging into this over the weekend as well, and I want to thank you for scrambling to put this all together. And I apologize if um, you know my my questions aren't super well honed because um, you know I'm just digesting all of this now. Um, so first of all, I I had some um, questions around just general uh, positions. Um, you know, I know that uh, during the June process, um, we uh, had to, to sort of uh, stop, stop filling positions. And I know our fire department was very uh, concerned about that. And so I want to thank you for um, acknowledging that. And um, because I think, you know, moving into the, the next year, we're seeing over and over again that we have some real um, needs with regard to fire. I was also wondering around, um, just in general, addressing COVID and sort of our HHCS needs, departmental needs, um, if there, and on top of that, I know the city attorney has been, um, and this is more around 
um, positions. I know the city attorney's office has been really working hard to address a wide variety of litigation. And then of course, helping with the, um, the reimbursement around COVID. And um, I'm, I'm wondering moving into these next few months and hopefully uh, we get a vaccine here. What sort of caveats do we have or what sort of um, um, cushion do we have to take care of the immediate health needs of our community in case we're not going to get real relief from um, from DC, essentially, I know you know there's this is still up in the air, um, but I'm just wondering if anyone from HHCS and I'm going to have a few questions from about uh, around the HHCS items. If anyone can um, can address that, whether we're going to be uh, be able to weather this storm around. Um, the COVID-19 and then um, vaccines, vaccine disbursement. I do think we'll be able to weather the storm, but I think Paul's on the call. Um, Paul, do you want to maybe address that? Well, here, while, while, while Paul comes, uh, comes around, I'm going to ask, oh, you're here. Hi, Paul. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. You can go ahead. Actually, um, Kelly Wallace is going to join, and he's been really looking closely at all those numbers. So if you want to ask a different question while he jumps on, that'd probably be helpful. Sure. Okay. So I have I have some questions, Paul, that that he'll probably be able to help answer as well. Um, in looking at um, the document, I think that you sent last night around the resource needs not included in the um, in the baseline. Um, I noticed that, you know, for instance, with the stair center, it <clears throat> is listed at um, 2.4. And I thought that, that we had reduced that to 2.2. Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious about that. Um, and then, um, I also was was curious around the Dorothy Day line items, both in terms of the shelter and the drop-in center. I know that um, three hundred thousand was covered through Measure P, um, but you know there, the line item here is for um, five sixty six, and I'm just wondering what uh, if that if you're then asking for an additional 266,000. And again, I apologize that, you know, I'm just now digesting all of this uh, today or this morning. Um, and then I see that there's a, uh, the $50,000 allocation to the locker program. And I do recall that we had also reduced it to 19K and so I guess my, my question for that is, is that, was that just the 19K from the measure P allocation or was it reduced from 50K to 19K just overall? So I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit curious around some of these, um, some of these line items. So that, that might be helpful uh, to know about. And one other thing I just wanna point out to, um, the city manager, and I know this is a huge uh, need and, and want, not only from the city manager's office, but from the council around sort of encampment resolution and sanitation and hygiene. Um, I know council member Harrison, you're nodding your head. This is something that I think everybody has spoken, the community has spoken, the council has spoken for, the city manager's office has said, we need to address sort of um, uh, sanitation and hygiene. And so one, one thing that I, I just wanna note that, that we may have a little bit of, um, I mean, they're never, they're never extra dollars, right? But, <laughs> but uh, if you recall, when we readjusted the measure P allocations, we put, put a set aside for, I think it was $805,000 for COVID-19 relief whatever, right? It was very, it was, not whatever, but it was very um, 
nebulous, right? The, the sort of overarching umbrella saying we definitely want it to go to homelessness. We definitely want it to be, you know, we don't want it be, to be spent anywhere else, but it was $805,000. So what I'm thinking is if you look at the panel of experts recommendations, particularly around health and sanitation, um, we had I think just in that particular column, we had, um, let me see here. We had the storage lockers were funded for 19K and the veterans drop-in center that sort of fit into that street and sanitation bucket. So I think we have a real opportunity to use some of that 805,000 to sanitation health and hygiene, so it will better reflect the panel of experts' recommendations to address health and hygiene. And I think that's that's a pocket of money that we haven't yet addressed and allocated. So it could, it could I mean, again, nothing is ever freed up, but it could free up a certain pocket of money um, that was addressed in the, the presentation um, that you provided. So that's $805,000 that I think um, could be could be really used uh, and is needed for our community and is um, just something to consider that I think that maybe um, we all had sort of uh, set aside but hadn't hadn't uh, thought about or maybe or maybe not I don't know so I guess I I, I want to hear from David and Paul and this sort of addresses the um, the you know the COVID-19 response as well so, um, so I don't know what my question is. I think you know, I, moving forward around uh, around COVID nineteen, and um, so uh, Kelly's on the call. Um, okay, thank you. Let, thank let you. Let's have him take a few moments to try and address most of the questions that you've asked. Um, okay, Kelly, thank you. We can start with the measure, the measure P allocation for the eight hundred five. Yeah, sorry. Nine months in, you would think I would know how to unmute myself by now, but here we go. Um, the 805, I will have to get back to you on that one. I apologize. Um, I, oh, I was just on with Lifelong. We're talking about the measure P, so I had it up, um, but I will look at that and get back to you as soon as I can. The um, locker program was, it had been reduced to 19,000. My understanding is, and I'll confirm it, because that's what had actually been spent for that year. So we hadn't reduced the program as a whole to 50,000. We were just at the time trying to really only be counting the dollars that we needed at that time. So we only put 19,000 in that budget. Moving forward, it was still gonna be 50,000, but we didn't need the 50,000 right then. Um, for DDH, uh, I know that I believe what is in it for that is um, they measure P did not fully fund them. And so part of it was to fund them fully. And then the second piece of that was they have increased cost because um, of COVID. They, they are now open 24 hours. Um, they have increased meal costs because they're not doing congregate meals anymore. They're doing sort of serving meals. So the containers to put those individual meals in to put them out into the community, there's increased costs around PPE. Um, so I believe, I will double check again, but I believe the DDH costs are A, to make it whole, but then also to account for the increase they have, costs they have because of changes that have been taking place because of COVID response. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. I mean, just the one thing that I just really wanted to, to flag for everyone is that eight hundred and five thousand dollars that I think oh, should yeah. be yeah should be dedicated to. I guess that's a, that will be a council decision. My opinion <laughs> is that um, because that's just a, a big area of need that was not addressed through those Measure P funds. That that we have essentially that eight hundred and five thousand dollars to dedicate somewhere, which could free up. Um, free up some of the, the allocations outside of Measure P, even though I understand it's all general fund monies. Um, yeah. Okay, 
So um, thank you, Kelly. I'm gonna all talk offline to you about, about that one. Um, a couple other questions I have, um, and I, I wanna be mindful of the time. I know we're, we're running a bit, a bit late. Um, where was this? So, Madam City Manager, in um, in June, you uh, I know there was a talk around a citywide risk assessment, and that's something that um, you know that was deferred, as well as a code enforcement workload analysis. And so I'm wondering how you're addressing those those two things, um, and and what sort of the status is of that need and that want, or how how that's um, how how we can move forward. Because I know now that, especially in talking about encampment resolution, uh, we no longer have um, Aaron Stefan uh, with us, and so. Uh, I'm curious what sort of in-house workload analysis maybe you've done, and also if you can speak to this citywide risk assessment and how we can move forward. So in terms of the citywide risk assessment, we do believe that that needs to be placed on hold for now. We're, the pandemic itself and our response, is, it is not our priority at this juncture. I, I do, I would like to reserve that to come back to council at a later time to talk about um, how do we move forward with um, assessing, assessing our risk over, over, over the city as well as how do we develop a structure. Um, as I've shared before, I do think this is a critical area where we are truly under, um, under structured for, if you look at other jurisdictions across the whole state, there are dedicated risk teams that are assigned to cities to manage. And, and, and if you think about some of the situations that we find ourselves in around everything from sidewalks to everything else, but the structure isn't there for the accountability for it. Um, our risk right now is looking at you know, our insurance coverage and our indemnification in certain contracts. And that is where our focus is and making sure that we are insured to do different things. But we certainly have to be a little more focused around our risk and our management of our risk. So um, I do think it's critical and important, but at this time we wouldn't be able to even execute. So we have to delay it and not set aside dollars for it at this time. It is critical. Um, so I want to be clear about that. Um, we are looking at small pieces, though. So as you um, may be aware, like for cybersecurity, um, we've been able to leverage some, some resources from that to kind of look at our cyber. So th that's, the ri that's a risk, right? That's, that's one of the pieces. And it's kind of pulled out of most things that would be included in a total risk assessment. So we'll continue moving that needle when we can, um, you know, and then we look at everything as we're approving different contracts throughout the city. So we are still entertaining what are our risks and do we have enough in place to, to make sure that the city is, um, is covered. And so if from that regard, we're okay. But when we talk about having a full understanding of our exposure, um, being able to create a structure where we're on top of it and we're more um, proactive around risk than we are reactive, we're, we're just not there yet. So, um, and again, with COVID, um, we just don't have the opportunity to do so right now. In terms of code enforcement, um, yes, we, we are already keenly aware that we are tremendously understaffed there. And we've made some, some movements to kind of um, look at our planning department, look at our code enforcement, where, the, where do they meet, where do they connect, how can we leverage the resources and provide that direct support when planning staff are out there dealing with planning issues and when code enforcement is out dealing with neighborhood service um, issues. So um, we are staffed right now in the unit. Um, as you know, before we had you know some attrition there and we have staffed that unit back up, but it is not staffed at the level for which we know we need to operate. So that may be something we entertain down the line, but at this time, it's not one of the, the top priorities that I have recommended to date. Okay, and, but I do see that we, you know, you do wanna address the, 
yes. um, encampment resolution. So in a way, that's sort of addressing the workload. <laughs> absolutely. It is yeah. absolutely the, one of the, the, the biggest response pieces for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and so I, you know, I guess my uh, my concern around just sort of staffing levels and being concerned around do we, you know, do we have enough staff um, within HHCS and even um, and even the city attorney's office because I know that's something that um, that they have been they've been very busy <laughs> as well. And whether um, I just want to make sure that we're, we we can um, address this what will be happening over the next couple of years, and I I I just want to hear sort of your your take on it, and because again I know I and the reason why I'm asking these questions I went through all of our deferrals in June and just sort of saw okay what you know what were some of these uh, things we had to put pause on, and um, I wanted to see. Uh, I just want to feel confident that we're going to be able to address uh, COVID-19 both with, within HHCS and have people to help us respond to that. And I see that um, that our city attorney is, <laughs> is uh, on the panel as well and, and making sure that we can, we can address these needs ahead. So I guess I'll, I'll ask um, the city attorney, what are some anticipated um, issues that you you are going to have to address in the city attorney's office um, and sort of your general outlook on your ability to um, to tackle that? I'm just trying to get information now. I don't have an angle. I'm just trying to get get information. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Drosty. That's a really good question. I think, uh, as Dee mentioned, uh, in addition to just the baseline work, the city's uh, attention has had to shift to COVID response. So, and my department is very central to that. Um, so I, we've been able to absorb and, and do what it uh, takes to handle that. Uh, but as, as that kind of still lingers, um, and we, I guess, we started out having, we have, when fully staffed, we have nine attorneys. We still have two vacancies. Uh, so there's seven of us for the whole city. We are um, in the process of, uh, with these blessing, uh, filling the eighth position, which is a very critical position. It's the HR litigator and the HR advice person. We've had to outsource that work. And I actually envision that resulting in some cost savings when we bring that workload in-house. Uh, we'll still be, have to rely on outside counsel for some of the lawsuits and arbitrations and some of that, but some of the, and some of the more specialized things like a CalPERS audit, you're gonna, to really do it justice, you really need to give that to an expert. Uh, but I think in the next few months, we'll be able to fill the um, HR attorney position and bring that in-house. And then I still have one more vacancy uh, for the police and um, uh, for the police work that um, we had a, a litigator that left and I'm still hoping to fill that position once I get all of those. Um, and that was one of the deferrals, unfortunately. So we'll just have to see how that uh, works. But once we have uh, the full staffing, which is nine attorneys, um, I think um, we should be able to provide the services that we need to. The one unknown thing that happens with my department is um, because we are a, a lot, we're constantly having to respond to external things like claims and lawsuits we don't have control over. That is the big unknown and having a, a healthy public liability fund to be able to fill those gaps and if we need to pay out a settlement or um, respond to a lawsuit. I think that is always um, really helpful. And Teresa and uh, Henry and Dee and David have been very supportive and really uh, working with our office to make sure that we have the resources that we need to, to protect the city. Um, Chair Drossi, if I can just add, um, one you. of the things that, you know, as we look at all of these, 
all of these needs in totality is, is that we're still focused on the priorities, right? So as long as we have our priorities laid out and we consistently apply our staffing to the priorities of this council, we're, we're, we're going to be fine. But I, I mean, Paul can certainly talk about whether or not we are, uh, you know, we are where we need to be for a COVID response from HHCS. On, I'll, I'll defer to him to, to really focus on it. I know we've added some positions there and we've um, supported the department in that regard. And thank you to council for that. Um, but, what we do, what we're doing right now when it comes to COVID and it comes to the top priorities for the council and to, to manage our operations, we're doing okay with the deferrals other than police and fire where we talked about, we're seeing staffing needs there and overtime costs. We're still doing just fine. Um, I, as long as we stay in the range of the priorities that we've established and we're allowed to continue working on COVID as a number one priority for the city. So I, I just wanna just say that we're living within, within yep. what we agreed to do around deferrals with the exception of police and fire. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly wasn't, um, uh, and I hope that was, um, I, I, I have com complete faith and you and our council in making sure that we're addressing COVID the best we can. This is just sort of a reflection of my nervous nature <laughs> and making sure that our, our community's uh, safe. Um, and, and on that note, I'll, I'll, I'll just reiterate, and I know I've said this before, that I you know, think it's absolutely essential that we um, ramp up our communications uh, department. So I just wanna acknowledge that as well, because we are having to communicate a lot with our community uh, around these public health orders and just doing an excellent job there under your leadership and Mathai and all of um, everyone within that department. So, so thank you for that. Um, and so one other thing I just would like to um, would like to add is, and this is something that I brought up before. Um, I'm really interested in this planning department equity consultant. And I think that this is something that, um, you know, that might merit um, further, further looking into and uh, especially, you know, in the moving into the years ahead, we, as we have seen from Sacramento, we have a lot of um, legislation that the city is constantly uh, having to adapt to. And I just think making sure that we have an equity lens within our planning department is really important. So I just want to single that out again and um, focus on that. And it's, it's something that I am excited to support or augment if we can. Um, okay, so having said uh, all of that, I, I have many, much more to say, but I'll, I'll save it for, <laughs> for offline. I, I do know that we have one more item on our agenda and I do see that we have two hands up. So I want to um, quickly, if I may, go to the mayor and council member Harrison before we go into our next presentation. And it would be nice if we could try to end by one. And I know we had a lot of questions on those items before, but I was wondering briefly if we could um, just quickly wrap up this item and then move on to the next one. Yeah, I just have an information request if we can get how much is currently available in, um, in Measure P, how much has been expended, what the balance is, because I know there's probably a, a balance from the fiscal 20 uh, revenues that have been received, um, the carry forward balance. And, and then also, um, I think we're going to have to take another look at all these allocations um, when we discuss the June, the June budget. Um, you know, we are going to be implementing an outdoor shelter program. Those are additional costs that we haven't even accounted for. We did budget 600,000. It's going to be more than that, probably, especially if we do two sites. So that means we're going to have to reprogram some money. So I'm just calling attention to that. It's something we're going to have to discuss in the future. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank and, you. And oh, may, oh, sorry, go ahead. Mayor, that'll... That That'll be an easy one for us. There's um, a couple of links I'll share with you that are posted on the city's website where we um, have provided the information on Measure P and Measure U1. So that work's already been done and I'll share that with you. Um, so you have that for the weekend. So that reflects the, 
the fiscal 20 close? Yes. Okay. They've then. been updated for the FY20 close. Thank you. Great. Councilmember Harrison? Yeah, just briefly, I wanted to say, because I forgot to mention before, I am in favor of filling the fire department positions. So I just want to put that on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I'm as well, and I don't want to use uh, Measure FF to backfill anything. Um, so, okay, great. So now I would like to move on to uh, the next presentation. So Madam City Manager, I'd like to hand it over to you. We're going to go ahead and, and have staff kick off um, for the next presentation. Okay, thank you. So this is um, the general fund reserves replenishment. Um, I do <laughs> have um, a couple of corrections. They're immaterial, but it makes the charts in this report inaccurate. And um, it's the same situation that actually we found ourselves in at the last meeting. Um, we want to, we had to update the um, excess equity report to reflect this new um, allocation that we have in the um, AAO for the $270,000 for reimagining. And if you give me a moment, let me just share um, this information. So just looking at the excess equity, and I'll up send you an up updated copy of the report with these two charts um, as soon as this meeting is over. Um, so I just want to show that the reserves, um, because we've incorporated the um, additional $270,000 for the reimagining, just goes from 1.636 to now 1.5. And again, that incorporates the $270,000. Um, including the AAO for reappropriation. And then I want to give you the balance of the reserve funds. Just give me a moment. And I will pull that up so you'll have that information as well. There we go. And that is this one. So I believe in the report, we show a 12.64% funding level or funded level um, with the allocation of the reserves that are proposed based on the excess equity calculation. The correct funding amount will be 12.56 based on that change in the excess equity. Um, again, I will um, incorporate that and update the report, um, those two charts in the report. The two things that we're asking you to consider are two different allocations towards the general fund reserve. One is based on your um, standard policy of the excess, based on the excess equity calculation. And um, again, that's where we get the 1.5 million. In addition to that, we're looking at an allocation to replenish the $11.4 million used to um, balance the FY21 budget. So um, that's what we're proposing. We're saying um, consider up to allocating 25% of that $9.1 million, um, which we've been talking about, the mayor mentioned before. That'll be about $2.3 million um, in as part of this appropriation. And then that should be looked at annually. So as we, um, the economy recovers, you know, we could take a look at it and adjust it up or down, however we go. And again, I wanted to reflect um, back to what Henry was saying as he's reporting on the revenues. I think it's important that we replenish our reserves um, because if our revenues do not come in as anticipated, we need a place to go. Our reserves are our safety net. So I just want to um, keep that in mind. So that's it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
Okay, so uh, we have a few attendees uh, still in the audience. Is this the, the conclusion of your presentation? Yes. Okay, great, thank you so much. So now I would like to move to public comment on this item. So if you are in the audience and you would like to comment on this item, uh, the general fund reserves replenishment, uh, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, don't be shy. This is actually an exciting topic. Uh, come on. All right. No, no, no public commenters. Okay. Bringing it back to committee. Um, council member, or actually uh, Mayor Erging. Thank you. So uh, if we did this 25%, um which would be about 2.3 million how long would it take for us to replenish the um the 11 million how many years so five years and that's if we um if that amount is sustained every year so about about five years okay i um you know i, I am actually supportive of, of considering this this proposal because i do agree we have to replenish the reserves um I think we can probably take a take a holiday on the 115 trust, um, but the most immediate issue is the um, making sure that we have an adequate reserve to account for any um, um, uh, catastrophic or fiscal emergencies. So um, I'm I'm going to crunch the numbers and think about it this weekend. And so if we took the 2.3 out, what would that leave us when you add everything up? But I think it's worth considering, and it, to the extent we can in a future fiscal year, increase that amount even further. I think we should consider doing so, so that we can um, have a, an adequate reserve. Where, you know, we were at, um, I think eighteen percent before um, before this, and now we're down to roughly thirteen percent. And it'd be good to get back to that goal that we that we established in two thousand and seventeen. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Council Member Harrison. Uh, yeah, Teresa, could I ask you to put the chart back up? I think I got a little confused here. Would you like the excess equity or the general fund reserves? The general fund reserve chart. Sure, just give me a moment, please. Okay. 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 So your the six point nine million is the balance after using the two point three. Is that correct? That's what you're saying. Your proposal is to put two point three in reserve, and then we balance as a balancing measure. We have six point nine left. Is that correct? So no. What this reflects. Okay. So this is the beginning balance. The 6.9 and the 4.5 is what we actually took out of the reserve to balance the budget. Okay. This, yes. Okay. Okay. And then the 8.83 and the 0.68, that equals um, the 148 or the 1 1.5. Um, it should. Um, that is the proposed allocation from the excess equity based on the excess uh -huh. equity calculation. And that gives you this balance. So not incorporate, and this is for Tuolumne. Okay. So not included in, in this calculation would be the additional amount that we're proposing of the 2.3 or whatever you, you determine, that is not included in this calculation. And what percent does that bring our reserve to? Um, it would be an additional $2.3 million. So I'll have them, we'll do the calculation right quick and I can let you know. Okay. And then can we go back to the excess equity chart for a second? Sure. Please. 
Okay, so this number yeah. here, the excess equity balance of 2.5. Yes. We would be taking 2.3 of that. No, okay, thank you. That's so, yeah, I'm sorry. Point. Okay, yes, thank you. I know the numbers are the same. I, I totally get it. So, okay. um, it would be 25% of the 9.188 million. Okay. So, we're proposing to take 25% of that amount and allocate it to replenishment of the general fund reserves. And if you take 25% uh, of that, that's where you get the 2.3 million. So our excess equity becomes? Um, well, it would be the same because um, we're sick. This has already been taken out. So instead of transferring this $9.1 million to um, capital improvement fund, so we've already taken it out. So instead of transferring it to the capital improvement fund, where normally it would be allocated, I mean, for capital projects, we're saying, put a hold on that. You're proposing set aside $100,000. We're saying in addition to that, set aside 25% of this $9.1 million, which will total the 2.3 million and move that 2.3 million into um, replacing, uh, replenishing the general fund. Reserve. So it's all tied to this $9.188 number that's already been extracted to give you this balance. Okay. So you've already, let me try this. You've already assumed sure. the 9.188 in capital. Yes. Okay. What you're saying is we will unassume 2.3 because it'll go to reserves. Mm -hmm. but, you, but we still have the ability to take the rest of this 6.8 that's the der derivative from 9.1 minus 2.3. Yes. And that would then make this balance bigger. Um, no, it would make this balance the same because it's basically, uh, um, so from the, the $40 million, we take out the transfer to the excess property transfer tax. So that's uh -huh. taken out. So that's, that's basically a number set aside on its own. So because this is already reduced, taken out, this number will not change. You would just be focused on now this as a standalone number. And from that, we're saying, take out the $2.3 million. Take 25% of this and set it aside to replenishing the, the reserves. And that's in addition to this 1.5 amount, um, which is just your normal excess equity calculation. So you would be actually replenishing the reserves with this what would normally be your transfer to the capital improvement fund. But only part of it. So where's the rest of it going? We're, however you, whatever you guys, however you guys decide. So I'm saying if we were to say today, we want to take a holiday on this policy, mm -hmm. that extra 6.8 would make this number bigger. Is that correct? Oh, would make the amount available for you to spend larger. Yes, the that's correct. Spend, the system. That's correct. Spend. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that would give you, so yes. Of, okay, great. So this number, were we to take a holiday on the rest of this policy, would now be 9.1, and then we balance that against all the needs you've identified. Your 11 million are very sad, $200,000. <laughs> and um, yeah, okay, I understand that. And this this chart also assumes that we are spending all of the Measure U1 fund balance, correct? And all of the Measure P fund balance. Based on this chart, yes, is taking all that money out. That's correct. You're taking it out, and then we have expenses that we're showing for homeless services, for example, just to use that as an example. Mm -hmm. We have expenses we're showing for that on the expenditure side, but we don't need to show it on the expenditure side because you've already removed the revenues. See what I mean? You've made the revenue number smaller. Yes. Right? And now you're still showing the expenditures. I feel like it's out of balance somehow, and I'm not expressing this very well. In other words, I think... Those expenses over on the other side, the expenses side for homelessness, we can take them out of the Measure P fund balance. If you so choose. Okay, okay, great. So I, I'm feeling like it may be a little double counted and I'm not sure how to deal with that and I'm not an accountant, so I'm gonna have to tell you later, but that's, that's my confusion, how all that works together. Well, we can talk offline. Okay. Like better. Thank you very much for your time. Sure thing. And I, I do approve of putting money back in the reserve as a 25%, by the way. So, okay. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, wow, okay, we have about eight, eight minutes, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm gonna be, I'm also gonna be digging through this. I, um, you know, of, of course I want to replenish our reserves. That's critically important. I'm interested in, um, in sort of a ramping, a ramping up um, if we have un unfunded needs. So, and I'm not sure what that might look like or even whether it's a good idea. I'm just spitballing right now. Just, you know, maybe, maybe having something like doing 20% the first year instead of having this equal. So we're, we're assuming that 25% uh, each year that we're gonna be um, in a similar financial situation. So I'm interested in this idea of, of meeting that end goal at the same amount of time and being fully replenished, but maybe having a ramp up of, um, and maybe just starting at, at, at 20 and then ramping up from there. And, and I'm sure there, there are pros and cons of that. And so I guess I'm just wondering what, what would be your, your take on that? Because I, 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 tr I trust your judgment, uh, Teresa and David on, on landing on that 25%. I know that when we talked about it briefly before you said, well, it would get us to that, what was it? Five-year mark. And it's, you know, a nice round number and evenly distributed, <laughs> but, um, but, but I imagine you thought about the, the ramping up and perhaps our immediate, our immediate needs next year and so on. Um, and there's, of course, this trade-off of need, uh -huh. needing to be able to access a large amount of money in our reserve fund and also want to, you know, of course, council wants a little bit more to, to allocate perhaps to some other needs. And so I, I'm just wondering if you could talk through some of your deliberations around that. Well, um, you have actually the policy says you have 10 years to actually pay it back. So you do have 10 years. Okay. Um, our only our only concern is that um, we want to make sure there's money there in case something else unexpected happens. Um, we do have some funding there, but we never want to actually exhaust our reserves. Um, so 20%, 25%, anything above um, that 1.5, anything that will contribute to that $11.4 million amount that was taken out to balance the budget would be would be good. So and you have definite flexibility. I, I know we have, you know, an, an incredible amount of needs um, um, to address. And it's it's a, a trade off. It is a balancing act. Um, but I, I um, we are recommending that something um, be placed in whether it's 20%, 25%, but something to replenish that reserves. Um, should be good, especially in light of the fact that we're not, um, we haven't really landed. We're just in the first quarter of our reserves and we don't know um, where we're gonna end up there, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you, that's that's helpful. Um, okay, well, um, I think that's, I'll just leave it at that. I'm sure I'll have some questions for you this weekend. Um, and again, I just really wanna thank you all for all this work you've been doing. I know you've been, piecing this all together over over several weeks and several months really and so I really want to acknowledge all the work that you've done and um, look forward to our conversation on Monday I don't know if look forward is the right phrase but um, <laughs> I look forward to delving into the materials and hopefully trying to make a, a, a good decision um, before we ad adjourn I see that Mr. Mayor has his hand up I see uh, Councilmember Harrison has her hand up. Um, it is 1256 and I also um, wanna ask our, our city manager if she'll have any additional comments, but first I'll go to, go to the mayor. I have a very important, I don't know if it's a short question, but if we did not, if we took a holiday on the allocation of the nine nine one eight eight five five five, are there capital projects that will not be done this year? Well, don't forget that we deferred um, a lot of the capital projects already. Um, I would have to really check in with PW. They do have um, a budget for this fiscal year that was adopted, um, mm -hmm. but I'd have to talk to them about. Um, I just want to know if not if doing a holiday on that whole amount 
means that certain that that they're not going to be able to implement their their capital Im improvement pl plan for this next. It this shouldn't year. because that's money above and beyond what was budgeted. So this is supplemental that mm -hmm. they they can use to add, to do additional capital yeah. projects. Yes, that's so correct. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and Councilmember Harrison. Thanks really quickly. That's that's why I asked how this money has been spent in the past. I'd like to see a list of the last couple of years to get a sense of the kinds of things we're giving up because I think we need to understand what we're doing on that. And then I was hoping to dispose of item four, which is the assignment of unassigned general fund balances to reserves from Councilmember Hahn. I really appreciate her bringing forward this concept and to make sure that our reserves are as healthy as possible. I think you tried to perhaps move this off action last time, it's still here. I've spoke, spoken with her, she's fine, I'm a co-author. Uh, she's fine with removing this and moving it, tabling any action, but I did wanna thank her for the work she did in thinking about these unallocated general fund amounts. Um, I think it's something we're gonna to have to get back to, but I'm hoping to just get it off our calendar for right now. Oh, that's a good idea, thank you. I. Um... Thank you for mentioning that. There are a few items that I'll um, on the agenda. So we'll move the number four to unscheduled. Um, we'll move number five uh, to unscheduled, and I'll check in with um, Councilmember Taplin. And um, yes, April. Councilmember Dressy. Um, so item number five doesn't transfer over to Councilmember Taplin. It stays as Councilmember Davila's item and it expires as of Monday. So if oh, you don't wow. take any action today, it will go back to Council without any action. Well, uh, I guess, I mean, that's what we, we have to do because we haven't, we've just been discussing the budget. So whatever the automatic thing is that happens, that's just what's going to have to happen because we've been um, really sort of elaborating on the budget here. So perfect, okay. thank you. That's I, helpful. I was hoping to table item four and take no action, not put it on um, unscheduled. Well, you oh. said that the author requested that the is, is removing the item. Yes, that's correct. She asked that we take no action. Okay, um, you great. Better let's, removed it, but. Let's, let's remove it then. I don't know what that, I moved to table it. <laughs> or take no action. <laughs> so is, I'm sorry, is Council Member Han withdrawing the item then? I think we should actually check in with Council Member Han. So yeah, Council Member Han. Let's okay. get on and then let's, why don't, she should either be at the meeting or submit a written okay. request to withdraw. Okay, great. So we're moving it to un unscheduled. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Madam City Manager, do you have any additional comments? Um, just that I want to make sure when we return on Monday that we are coming back with um, and that we um, schedule the meeting agenda appropriately. So are there any specific things other than bringing back the AAO, the excess equity, just the, ba the basic things that we'll schedule and post for the community? Are there any additional um, notices, noticing of, of what, we, what you want to hear about on Monday? Oh, I see. I don't think so. I think this covers it. If we just keep all of these agenda items on. Okay. That should cover it. Just wanted to make sure that we're clear on what Mondays will entail. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Well, I again, I want to thank you all for everything that you've done. This is uh, quite a body of work. And, um, and so I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, uh, clerk, will you please call the roll? Ms. Mayor Ergine? Yes. Councilmember Harrison? Yes. And Councilmember Drosty? Yes. Thank you all so much okay. for being here. Thank you.